<laughs> I'd like to call the February 28, 2018 Township Committee meeting of Long Hill Township to order at, uh, I guess it's 741. Would everybody please rise, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Debbie, would you please take roll? Miniman Maringolo. Here. Miniman Ray. Present. Miniman Schuler. Here. Deputy Mayor Dorsey. Yep. Mayor Pasercia. Present. Um, okay. So I think, and first off, I, I apologize uh, that we were a little bit late. We'll go right to the discussion items, and we have uh, Mr. Timothy Bradley here. Uh, we're going to go over some, uh, I guess, recommendations update regarding the sewer plant, the wastewater plant. Uh, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to join everyone in the audience and hold down a screen. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. Okay, well thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Bradley. I'm with the firm Kleinfelder, located in Princeton, New Jersey. I'm here to report on the uh, results of the capacity assurance report update that we recently completed for the township. And just by way of background, I've been in the wastewater uh, treatment business for over 36 years now, studying, designing, constructing, and operating improvements uh, for wastewater treatment plants. So what I'd like to uh, briefly review today is, first of all, the, the purpose of a capacity assurance report. I'd like to present an overview of the existing wastewater system. I'd like to then present the conclusions and outcome of the initial capacity assurance report that was prepared in 2010 and to discuss the objectives of the update of the capacity assurance report that we just completed, what that yielded in terms of updated current and future flows, as well as updated uh, improvements and costs for two purposes. One, to accommodate, it, to accommodate a future flow within the sewer service area and to comply with a future ethanol limitation for total phosphorus uh, that will be uh, implemented here very soon. So first of all, the purpose of a capacity assurance report is fundamentally to identify what improvements, if any, are required to accommodate anticipated growth within the sewer service area and to ensure reliable permit compliance. In so doing, a facility plan is established for addressing future needs and water quality protection. This is fundamental planning, it's very important, and it's why the NJDEP requires that permittees prepare a capacity assurance report when actual flows to a wastewater treatment plant approach the permitted capacity of the plant. So uh, relative to your existing system, there's two main elements to it. The first is a wastewater treatment plant. 
The second is the wastewater collection system that delivers flow to the wastewater treatment plant. This slide depicts the flow of wastewater through the treatment plant and the steps and unit processes that are involved. So the flow first comes in and it is pumped. The purpose is to increase the elevation of the wastewater so it then can flow by gravity through the rest of the treatment plant. The steps involved are first screening to remove coarse debris from the wastewater prior to biological treatment. Biological treatment occurs within these two sets of tanks, the oxidation ditches. That's where the microorganisms that provide biological treatment reside. A flow pushes those microorganisms out of the oxidation ditches into the final clarifiers. The microorganisms are settled into final clarifiers. Those microorganisms are then returned to the oxidation ditches so they can continue the process of biological, treat biological treatment. And the clarified effluent then moves on to the effluent filters for further removal of suspended solids. That's followed by post aeration to add additional oxygen to the treated effluent, followed by UV disinfection to disinfect the wastewater prior to discharge to the Passaic River. Sludge generated by this process is initially stored in a storage tank. It then is thickened to reduce the cost of disposal, so you truck less water to uh, disposal, and then the thickened sludge is stored until it is hauled off site for disposal. As I mentioned before, the microorganisms, referred to as return sludge, are recycled back to the oxidation ditches so the biological treatment process can, uh, can continue. This plant is located, if you haven't been there, at the uh, end of South Warren Avenue. It's, uh, it exists next to the Passaic, the Passaic River. Um, these are the components, these oval-shaped tanks or the oxidation ditches, for example. These are the clarifiers and the filters and the post aeration and UV disinfection are all basically located within this building. Plant was originally constructed in the 1930s and it was upgraded a couple of times and expanded um, over the years. It's permitted capacity, that means the capacity authorized by the DEP is 0 0.9 MGD or million gallons per day. Now the actual flow to the plant has exceeded the permitted capacity now for many years, which is why 10 years ago you did a capacity assurance report and we updated it just now. Now, why does the actual flow exceed the 0.9 MGD? In your case, it's due to groundwater and rainwater entering the wastewater collection system through defects in the system. This, is, this occurs in all wastewater collection systems. It's not unique to Long Hill Township. That extraneous flow is referred to as infiltration and inflow, or I and I. It's important to recognize that as collection systems age, this I and I can increase over time as the wastewater system continues to age and deteriorate. Okay, the wastewater collection itself consists of the components listed on this uh, slide. There's 286,000 plus or minus uh, feet of township-owned sanitary sewers. There's 220,000 feet of privately owned service laterals. There are the pipes that connect the houses and the commercial establishments to the township-owned sanitary sewers. There's about 1,260 manholes, eight pumping stations, and 15,200 feet of force mains. Force mains are the pressurized pipe that can flow from the pump stations into the uh, sanitary sewer system. In terms of the age of the system, the original portions of this uh, system date to the 1930s and the 1940s. And in the 1970s, significant additions occurred um, uh, to the system. As I mentioned before, as systems age and progressively deteriorate, that I and I flow uh, increases. So in terms of the initial capacity assurance report prepared in 2010, the key conclusions uh, from this report were first on the top of this slide that based on a cost comparison of various combinations of plant improvements and sewer system rehabilitation to reduce infiltration and inflow, it is not cost effective to remove I and I 
to provide sufficient capacity for future growth. You simply can't cost effectively remove that much I and I to address your future capacity needs. And that's, that's, that conclusion is drawn from this cost summary presented in the table, where we looked at three scenarios for system upgrades. In the first, there was no I and I reduction, but significant plant improvements. The cost of that alternative was $4.1 million. The next scenario to is remove about 25% of the I and I through sewer rehabilitation and, and a reduced extent of plant improvements. That cost jumped up to 8.3 million. And in the third scenario, we looked at about a 50% reduction in I and I and even fewer plant improvements, and that cost increased to $6.8 million. That progressively significant increase in cost led us to the conclusion that we're better off to uh, convey the current amount of I and I to the plant and deal with it there. But there was also a recognition, as summarized here, that the sewer system can't be left alone to continue to deteriorate. That while doing this, there also needs to be in place a program to periodically make improvements to the system so that as the system continues to deteriorate, you make improvements to offset the additional I and I generated by deterioration in the system. Um, also, <clears throat> a part of this capacity assurance report was to look at compliance into the future. And at that point, it was known that uh, one of the parameters, total phosphorus, was going to be regulated to a more stringent level in the future. That was a result of the Passaic River total maximum daily load study performed about 10 years ago, which led to the conclusion or the need for all the dischargers to the Passaic River to lower their phosphorus discharges from about 4 milligrams per liter, which is what the current effluent limit is, to 0 0.76 milligrams per liter. Again, Longhill Township is not alone in this. We're joined by all the other dischargers uh, to the Passaic River. And how the DEP is managing this is as your discharge permits are being renewed, which happens on five-year cycles, uh, that new permit is being, limit is being incorporated into the renewed permit. Uh, your fellow dischargers who've already had their permits renewed already have uh, this F limitation, for example, the Rockaway Valley Regional Sewage Authority, the Madison Chatham Joint Meeting, both other dischargers the Passaic River, they already have this F limitation in effect. The township submitted its renewal application a couple of years ago. The DEP has not yet renewed it, but they're currently working on the draft renewal of your permit. So as soon as that is issued, you will have this new F limitation to uh, to comply with. So what was the outcome of that initial capacity assurance report? There was a decision to defer the implementation of improvements to accommodate the future anticipated flow within the sewer service area. There was a decision to defer implementation of improvements to comply with the future TP limit until specifically required by the NJDEP. There was also a decision to proceed with a project that included two needed improvements to the wastewater treatment plant, as well as the first phase of sewer rehabilitation. That first phase involved about 13,000 linear feet of the sewer system, or about 4.6% of the overall system. Total project cost was about 2.6 million, roughly half of which was related to sewer rehabilitation, the other half to the plant improvements. So now 10 years later, what were the objectives of the capacity assurance uh, uh, report update? Well, first of all, was to update the current wastewater characteristics. How has the flow changed in the last 10 years? To also update the projected future wastewater characteristics, to use that information to update the assessment of plant capacity, and then the improvement needs to accommodate the future flow, what those costs are to also update the assessment of cost to comply with the future effluent limitation for total phosphorus. This slide presents the updated current and future costs. The middle column shows the current flows and, 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 and you'll see that there are numerous flow conditions presented. 
That's because the flow into a wastewater treatment plant is not constant. It varies hourly, daily, monthly, and annually uh, in response to changes in uh, groundwater levels, the amount of rain, et cetera. And so, for example, your current annual average flow is 1.04 MGD. Again, that's greater than your permitted capacity of 0.29. Your maximum monthly average flow, that means the 30-day highest average flow during the course of the year is 1.8 MGD. Your maximum daily average flow, meaning the highest average flow during a 24-hour period, is about 3.5 MGD. And on a peak hourly basis, it's about 4.4 MGD. These are relatively standard peaking factors at treatment plants. This is not unique to Long Hill Township. In terms of the future flow, this 1.24 MGD is the flow that was developed um, when the interim wastewater management plan update was prepared by uh, Morris County about um, 10 years ago. The township is currently in the process of, of further refining the build out analysis, but this is this is the flow, future flow as it, as it now exists. These the corresponding max month, max day, peak hour derive from the peaking factors uh, associated with the current variability in flow. Um, and some other conclusions that were made based on the review of the current flow data is that really there's been no measurable decrease in the infiltration inflow by comparing the bef to the before and after of the sewer rehabilitation project uh, that was completed a couple of years ago. And why is that? Well, the system has continued to age over 10 years, and yes, 4.6% of the system was rehabilitated. You would expect that the I and I would have been reduced within that area of the system. However, at the same time, 95% of the system continued to deteriorate. Uh, so, so basically, the additional I and I uh, resulting from that further deterioration was offset by the, the uh, reduction in I and I that occurred in that 4.6 percent of the system. This is an example why it's important to have an ongoing program of sewer rehabilitation so that we don't have a net increase of I and I over time. Okay, so after looking at those future flows and looking at the capacity of the plant and what the capacity deficiencies are for those future flows, we identified two alternatives which we uh, then prepared costs for. The first we called the flow equalization alternative. That was the basically the same alternative recommended in the initial um, capacity assurance report. What happens under that scenario uh, a flow equalization tank is constructed and all flow greater than the current peak flow capacity is, of the plant is temporarily diverted into a storage tank. It remains there until the flow decreases within the plant and the flow in the, in the equalization tank can be released into the treatment plant. So you're basically shaving off the peaks, putting them in a tank and storing the flow until the plant can handle that. that uh, that, that wet weather flow. Um, cost of that alternative was, is $4.4 million. And it, it primarily involves constructing about a 1.6 million gallon, very large storage tank at the site of the treatment plant as well as related improvements. The other alternative we looked at, we called the plant expansion alternative. And there, rather than shaving off the peaks and putting the flow into storage, we increased whatever components of the plant can't handle that peak flow. And in this case, the cost was significantly less at uh, $2.8 million. Um, and how we're able to do that, there's a relatively new but well-proven filter technology uh, today available that achieves a much higher capacity of filtering in a much smaller footprint than the existing filters are able to do. You currently have sand filters, which are robust, you know, well-performing filters, but they take up a lot of space and yield limited capacity. For example, at the present time, the plant can only handle about 2.8 MGD of flow through the, through the filters. And as we saw in a previous slide, you have daily peaks over three and peak hourly 
uh, flows over four. So, you know, the, 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 the existing filters are clearly being stressed. We can fit uh, filters with much greater capacity and less footprint currently being occupied by the existing filters um, you know, within that same space at relatively low cost in comparison to a flow equalization tank. Um, so the recommended alternative to provide for future flow is, is plant expansion. Now, the same thing applies as did in the original capacity assurance report. You can't let the sewer system continue to deteriorate, or you know what? At the 5.2 MGD future peak flow will become six or seven or eight MGD if the system is, is left to just continue to deteriorate and for the INI flows to increase. So in conjunction with this, there just needs to be an ongoing program just like you do with roads, you can you, you pave certain percentage of the road every year. You need to you need to rehab a certain percentage of the sewer system uh, on an annual or every two year basis to keep up with that uh, deterioration. Relative to that uh, compliance with the future total phosphorus effluent limitation, there was then and still is only one viable alternative and that is a coagulant storage and feed system to enable chemical precipitation of phosphorus. That's what all your fellow uh, dischargers are using at the present time or will be using to achieve the same phosphorus limit. Um, it involves the construction of, of storage and feed systems. The budgetary capital cost for this improvement is about $0.8 million. Probably more significant is that there is a uh, fairly significant chemical cost to do this. Now, this is a very conservative estimate, $146,000 a year. Um, in order to refine that, there needs to be site-specific testing to confirm the optimal coagulant to use, what the site-specific coagulant dose will be, and as a result, the corresponding cost. This is based on a conservative coagulant at a conservative dose. So, so hopefully your cost would be a bit less than that, but that is the conservative estimate. As I mentioned before, this new TP effluent limit will be incorporated into the renewed uh, discharge permit, and the DEP is currently working on that, uh, that draft renewal, so it should be here relatively soon. Now, that permit will not say you need to meet this compliant instantly. Typically, they give you a default three-year compliance schedule, uh, which if there's good reason to, it can be uh, reasonably extended beyond the three-year compliance uh, period. So this is the summary of the capital needs and budgetary costs resulting from the capacity assurance report update. So looking at these improvements, the plan expansion to accommodate future flow, $2.8 million, compliance to the new TPF limit, $8 million, certainly makes sense to do these projects as part of a single construction project to, uh, to uh, ultimately reduce costs rather than to do this through two separate contracts. Uh, the total estimated implement implementation time for a project such as this when you factor in design and permitting and bidding and construction is roughly uh, 30 months. Uh, there is low interest financing available through the New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure Financing Program like the township used this program to fund the improvements uh, resulting from the initial capacity assurance report update that uh, totaled about $2.6 million. These costs do not include the costs uh, to implement a periodic sewer rehabilitation uh, program uh, over time. And with that, I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Yes, sir. 4.6% of the mileage. Was that 4.6% of the town owned mains or of the total including land? Of the town, township owned mains. So it's really only about 2% of the total plumbing. Correct. And that cost us well, million three? It did. Now, what was included as part of that, um, the primary point in which service laterals are known to be a problem is at the point at which they connect to the sewer main. 
that connection point frequently is the first thing to deteriorate and fall apart, and that becomes a major source of uh, infiltration inflow. That project for $1.3 million included the cure-in-place lining of those service lateral connections to ensure a, a tight connection of the service laterals back to the service to the sewer mains. Tim, thank you. Okay. So if we can move on to the next discussion item, it's the wastewater treatment plant management. This is, I mean, we have so many interesting topics tonight. Um, so do I turn that over? Sure, actually, to um, Nancy? I'm gonna invite our DPW director, Tom Sweeney, up to the microphone. Um, this is something that I coincidentally came across and hadn't realized that you had all discussed um, previously, but considering the fact that the um, referendum failed, um, I came across a, a bid in another town for the, um, they were bidding out the management of the wastewater treatment plant. I know that we are understaffed in our, um, in our plant and it seemed like a way to possibly save money and you know provide efficient services at the same time um especially considering the fact that there's a good possibility that the um sewer fees are going to significantly uh increase this seemed like an opportunity to explore a way to save some money in that regard so um I brought it up with the committee and uh we wanted to discuss it publicly but I thought that it would be helpful to have uh, our DPW director, who uh, is in charge of the sewer plant, ultimately um, give some give some details of, about the possibilities. So you want to turn it over to him? Sure. Okay. Uh, for, for those watching at, at home, it's Tom Sweeney, DPW director. Good evening. Uh, as Nancy pointed out, uh, you know we're researching um, having. Um, privatization of management of the wastewater treatment plant only because uh, the, the situation we're in because of the sale uh, currently right now we're at a uh, three and a half man staff in wastewater we should be at five or more uh, so in my 2018 projected budget I put in for two individuals and that cost is a lot higher than our our current uh, budget so that was the uh, the thought to maybe look into uh, privatization to see if that is a, uh, a cost alternative. Um, so um, there is some comparisons. You know, there's there's different scopes of work. You can have a private company come in and and run everything, or just manage the staff we have. You know, we we kind of pursued um, a company to maybe run everything, but. Doing some comparisons, it might be a little cheaper, but then there might be extras you'd be paying for, like contractors come and respond to blockages or if a pump goes at the plant, you know. So um, it's pretty close on, on course. Um, I did tour uh, Chatham Township's uh, treatment plant recently. Their treatment plant is very similar to ours as far as the flow and the concept. 
they currently have a six-man staff with three licensed professionals on staff. We currently only have one. Uh, so, and really the one we do have uh, is, is only certified to run a plan on a temporary basis with DEP because uh, our current uh, operator left. So, um, Are the Chatham folks uh, Chatham employees or outsourced? They're Chatham employees. Uh, Six-man staff, like I said, uh, three licensed men, uh, one, uh, one individual just does lab work, where in our case, our men do, do everything. Uh, but uh, right now, we're just doing the bare minimum. Three and a half men is not getting us to do any um, eye and eye work, any cameraing or jettering of, of lines that we were doing with a six-man staff and for a small amount with five-man staff. So if, if, if our projection is to start doing a lot more wastewater because, you know, we own a place now, we're going to have to beef up the staff or look at other alternatives. You know, I've, I've put in... Basically, uh, basically what we're talking about is just outsourcing labor. They'd still report to you. That, that could happen, yeah. That could happen. Right. What? Uh, uh, private companies can do that. I, I think they offer uh, various, you know, they could just... Put the bodies in and right. and have us manage it. You know, the town's still going to have to be responsible for capital projects, engineering. We own the all assets. That stuff. It's our responsibility for uh, the investments. It's just labor here, right? Right. You know, essentially, uh, the school district did an outsource for uh, janitorial services several years ago. Mm -hmm. Similar similar concept. Right. Uh, you know, we researched this before the sale of the plant years ago, uh, Cornell probably remembers. By the time, we had a five-man staff, three licensed uh, individuals working there, so that was kind of off the table, wasn't even considered. But now we're, we're, we're in a bind. If I, if I lose my operator right now, we're really in a bind for staffing, you know, to run the plant. So, you know, we're at the crossroads. Uh, do we want to beef up our staff and, and get back on track, or do you want to outsource and, and maybe save some money? Well, I, you I know, mean, um, I, mean I, I think it's a simple issue of how many people do we really need to run the plant to do what we what we need, right? We we have three today. We had four. We know we need a fourth for sure. Well, we had for I, many the, years the fourth being a licensed operator. For years we were at five. Now the question for, I for years we were at six. How far back? For six years we were at six individuals. In 2013 we went down to a five-man staff because okay. we were. Through efficiencies, road department right. took over grass right. cutting, you know, right. screens went away, yep. stuff yep. like that. So, so we only went to four in 2016 in the fall when one of our individuals retired with the sale of the plant. Right. We, didn't, what, we didn't want to bring We weren't going to bring somebody in. We, so we, so we, five is your magic number minimum. But we, at one point fairly recently, we transferred... Um, my that was yeah, that was the fall of 2016. Right. That that was transferring a position from wastewater to DPW. Right. So can we just transfer that back and then hire our operator and then we're at five? Right. And that's what right. I projected. Two okay. two individuals. Right. Right. Um, I think you had brought this up at some point, or some somebody else mentioned this. Um, do we leverage the sewer plant staff for snow removal? Yes, we do. So then if we outsource, we have a problem on staffing with snow removal. Yes. So we need to understand the impact of that right. in the decision as well. How many, how it's many? about $1,069 a storm. I did a cost analysis of overtime over the last eight years of how many times we use waste sort of staff. We don't use them every storm. Right. On big plow, we will use them, three pickup trucks. But you're not going to be able to use them if they're an outsourced sewer service. Correct. Right? So and we're going to have what to was the go. I, so, what was so, the cost? so what I've done in the past, when our road department staff was very low, is we hired contractors driving DPW, truck, DPW trucks at the CDL at a rate. And that was my backup plan if the sewer plant sold. And if I lost those three individuals plowing, that's what we were going to do. Because we still would have had those trucks. Right, if, and, it, and, and if you outsource, you'll still have those trucks right, to utilize. Right. When, when used, which was not every storm, how much was it? It, it worked out to about $1,069 a storm. That was the eight-year average. How many times I use them for overtime, 
Okay. There's no way to quantify straight time. Could you estimate on, on an annual? I know it's eight years. Maybe one year it was five. Well, we don't. We don't. We don't need it now right. unless we decide to move forward. With well, the average I'm, is three I'm, times. The average it. is three times a year. Right. Okay. So three thousand dollars, a little bit more. Right. What What's your recommendation? Hire employees or outsource the labor? If you want to do it right, hire employees. Get the right individuals in there to run the plant. If you want to do I'm not going to say a poor job of running it, a, an average job of running the plant and cut some costs and sub it out. But, you know, some of that you lose control, but you're saving money. How, Do we how, want to get back on track and really get that plant back in operation and meet these requirements and start jetting and camera? It's going to cost. And five men that I suggest it is a minimum. Sick, you know, because you got to remember, there's, there's people that take vacations, there's people calling sick. There's many times right now I've got one guy in that plan and, and that's uh that's unacceptable i mean i have something but i'd rather let others the not ask you a question yeah so so here's the thing uh Use the mic the residents the residents of long hill township voted to keep their plant correct uh, i would be inclined and 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 the manager is now telling us that he thinks it's best to keep our employees and keep it in house. So, I mean, without having a deeper conversation, I'm inclined to agree with uh, DPW Director Tom Sweeney that we if, keep it in well, house. So if I can, if I can just, since I'm the one that that asked for this, um, I wasn't asking you to make a decision. I was asking, um, do you think it's worthwhile to um, put out a bid? With Jack tells me we have the ability to put in there that we have the right to reject all bids. Um, to see if it will save, it's been estimated to save $150,000. Um, and it should be noted that there are other towns, we did talk to other towns who use um, companies such as the one that we talked to, and mm -hmm. they are very happy with the operation. But I recognize what you're saying. I'm just looking for options to save money, continue, considering you know that there's gonna be fee raises. So my suggestion to you or recommendation was, do you want to go out to bid to get a cost to see how much it's going to save so you can make a more informed decision. Uh, can we turn yeah, it over to Jack at this could point? I ask one, can I ask one question? Uh, Tom, you said that the, you, you, you lose control, right, with, uh, with, with going... You lose some part of your control, sure. What kind of... What's the impact of that? Like, like you give me examples of the, of the control well, you lose. In our current budget, in our operating budget right now, we, um, we budget for X amount of dollars for plant maintenance pumps and stuff you know that you're replacing same went out on on the road for pump station and all that uh if you're paying an outside company x amount of dollars per year to maintain all that will they spend the money on that or will they totally wait till a pump goes before you replace it you know you, you have no over, oversight on that where right now we have guys on staff and, and they're important to me and, and we make the judgment call to replace. So, you know, there's, there's some things you, you do lose a little control over. Um, right. You know, the snow plowing end of it, you know, that's yeah, it's, that's a small amount compared to the big picture yeah. uh, on that. It's a concern, but it's a small amount. I mean, I, I think it's wise to do the exercise to go out to bid and, and see where the costs come in. And... Um, and, and at that point, make a decision. There's no harm doing that if you have the right to reject them. Um, but the bottom line is, is, is we, we do need to do something this year. Uh, at a three and a half man staff, um, it's you know it's not run right. I, I can't do any um, extra stuff outside the routine daily maintenance right now. It would seem to me that um, if we have the right to re reject all bids. And the director is saying that uh, there's no harm, no foul here. And I would say let's go and, and solicit bids and see where the numbers fall. Yep. I, I, I would agree with that. I, I kind of would also add, I, I'm not sure that we need to wait to actually put an additional body in the plant mm -hmm. but to, to deal with what has to be dealt with on an ongoing basis every day. like. Yeah, you know, my, my presumption is that any type of outsourcing agreement, typically what they usually do is they hire 
potentially a number of your existing staff anyway. Correct. Right? So, you know, we know three is not enough. We know we should be looking mm -hmm. at five. So do we go and hire a fourth? Now, I, I probably wouldn't suggest hiring the operator. Not sure if that guy might make the cut. Or, or maybe that's yeah. the one I don't well, that's, know. Yeah, that's that's the problem. Right. That's and, the key the, person that we do need right now. And, and, and in the, the other DEP's eyes. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, is there? I think we're also going to be faced with potentially some challenges with finding an operator. Just correct in general. Correct. Right. Because they mm -hmm. are in fairly high demand, and there aren't many of them. Do we have anybody on staff that could go through the uh, certification? Well, right now our current uh, employee uh, is one step lower than the criteria to run the plant. We have an approval from DEP temporarily that he could operate one step lower, temporarily after our other um, uh, superintendent left. He is sitting in for his class in March for the second time, and he won't want to find out till the end of April if he okay. passes. He did sit in in, well, then, in October, right. failed it, but you know that test you need years of service on the job to sit in for that and and he did did us a great favor by trying to take the test in october and take get it early, he's yeah. trying again and right. you know and if if it happens where he passes his test well now he's going to be the chief operator and right. we're good but we're still going to so need in right, dep's yeah. eyes right. as a backup operator yep right but, but we, you know, else concerned right yeah exactly well, so we'll, so either way you you need a right. uh, a licensed individual yeah. We'll, we'll need to figure this out as part of the budget process, which we had our first meeting um, today about. Um, so we'll, okay. I'm mm -hmm. sure, regroup back. Did the DEP define temporary? They knew, well, when our, uh, our former superintendent left, we had two weeks to name a individual. Right. With like, and you remember, you and I so, uh, did that exercise, it. And, and it was it was locked up with Vinny being our, our operator and a outside contractor's backup operator, which I retain. Uh, and they knew it was till to the sale of the plant till that date, you know. So we we're extending that temporary status right now. But could so, they turn around? In they haven't reached out to us. They, I sent, they sent me, the, the uh, uh, enforcement officer sent me an email uh, somewhere around December. You know, uh, don't invite just how problem. things are doing. Exactly. You know, exactly. but, don't um, call them up and say, "Are we still okay?" Yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, our, our our current operator right now is doing a very good job uh, of of keeping things getting together there. But um, boy, if we lose him, we could be in trouble. So, all right. So I think the the answer is let's yep. go out to bid, as and long as we can reject all bids. Yep. It, I don't know and. Yeah, I was going to say, Jack concerned yep. me because he's feverishly looking in there. With, 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 with that restriction, and, and I'd also right. suggest that, we'll, we'll um, before we do. Okay. <laughs> that, that Nancy sits down with Tom to Understand ensure personnel. that all the possible things that we might need are covered in a personnel contract that we might do with someone. So, for example, like change a pump, right? They might say, "Oh no, that's a capital project." Oh, and, we and when we, we go want, out, right? We, yeah, when we go out to bid, right? Sure. We don't. We don't want to do that. That's extra, right? Right. We want to make sure that all those things are going to be inclusive in the contract. Otherwise, we're not going to get an accurate comparison, okay. right? Because I know there's a lot of stuff. That, you know, you guys are almost like MacGyver down there, right? There's a lot of a lot of stuff that they just fix. That these guys, you know, under a contract, they may turn around and say, oh, that's not part of the contract. We, you know, we need to charge you extra for that. We, well, need, a, well, we need a work order. We need to change some, order. Some will do that. Right. But if you want everything, you know it's going to go up. But, but of course, they can right. do that. Right. You know. Mm hmm Okay. Everyone okay? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Tom, thank you. Thank you. Um, before we jump off this wonderful topic of wastewater, <laughs> um, I mean, I know I didn't have any questions for, for Tim on the study, um, but now that we've seen what he has to say and what are we doing? Like, what are our next steps? Well, I was under the impression we don't have a choice, but I'm, I'm willing, 
Well, yeah. I, I, I think. Okay, why don't you why don't you ask your question and make a statement? Well, well, well so on. well, so we need some next steps, right? So we we we. You know, we had the meetings with the DEP. They, they, you know, they're happily patient now that we've got this. I'm, I'm not trying to suggest we're adopting anything tonight, but um, I mean, I think clearly, from a financial perspective, the choice between the flow tank and the plant upgrades is fairly simple. I'm taking the cheaper one, um, but as he outlined, as Tim outlined in the report. Even though we did some I and I, we haven't really made a dent in the number, right? And you know, in the whole report, uh, there's only a couple of sections I really highlighted, and one of them was on page five, the second paragraph. It appears I and I creep due to ongoing deterioration of the 95 and change percent that wasn't re rehabilitated, more than compensated for the reduction in I and I that occurred in the portion that was, right? So we got nowhere. Well, we, we, we knew that. Was we knew, right? So, so we need to, and he, and he reiterated it a couple of times, we have to start investing in cleaning up or, or remediating the I&I. &I. So, which so, was Remington and Vernick's report. Which was also Remington and Vernick's, right? They had about eight, roughly 800,000 a year on top of the other capital, mm -hmm. which, by the way, we still have their recommendations to look at as well for how much? Yeah, if you could make that clear, because I think some people at home might be confused. They're thinking, oh, look, low number. No, that's not quite right. Okay, so, so yes, yeah, so fair point. So, so the Kleinfelder study that we heard about tonight gets us simply out of the sewer ban and gets the, you know, makes the DEP happy because we are consistently exceeding our capacity by a lot. Okay, this does nothing to resolve any ongoing improvements and maintenance that needs to take in place in the plant. For example, a pump replacement or a pumping station upgrade or pipelining or all the other things. We had another study done a year ago now, a year in a month, Remington and Burnick, that averaged about $1.4 million of capital above and beyond what we were doing at the time. Now there is a small amount of overlap with some of what he's doing. For example, Remington and Burnick had, you know, upgrade and modify sand filters. Well, if we, if we do this, the sand filters are going bye-bye. We don't need to do those line items. But we're really only talking about 100,000, 200,000 out of a million four. So the question is, how much do we want to start thinking about chewing off on this as we approach the budget season? Because we are getting to that rate time. Um, we would like to also, we have to do the, the, the WIMP as it's called now. I think Paul needs to do the WIMP with the he's, county he's working with the on state. It. Um, which potentially will modify this document, right? Um, this document presumes the current 1.24 million gallons um, is the actual WIMP number, and we think that the actual WIMP number is just guessing probably going to be 1.4 or 1.5. Um, I, I think in speaking to Tim, that would only represent the marginal increase in this document. But how much do we want to start thinking about funding? We've got 3.8 or 3.6, right? That's well, that's clearly a bond. That's the capital and 146 in chemicals. Well, the, right. Then we've got so, on top so, of one, yeah. On top that, of that, that was a that was a total mm -hmm. surprise, right? We've got 146 thousand dollars a year in chemicals. Yeah. That's a 10 percent rate increase all by itself. There's also additional. Sludge disposal disposal costs, which are about fifty thousand a year. Right. So it's about so it, two hundred thousand operating. It, it gets worse, right? So 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 we've got ten percent okay. there. You 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 know, and if you're if you're borrowing a bond for the three point six million, then you might as well talk about how much more of the Remington Burnick stuff you want to borrow because bonding is expensive, mm -hmm. right? The legal. 
the, the, they're sort of flat. Whether you borrow one million or five million, it's still X to go to bond council. And, and to your point, Cornell, you, as you said, the deterioration of, on one hand, took away any increase. So we have we have to do that. How much we don't know, but we have to. Well, do well, we've got a recommendation. Mm -hmm. We've got we've got the Remington Vernick report, right? Yeah. We can choose to ignore it. And, and we said we would do a million a year way back then. I mean, 2013 we was, we said we would do an, a million based yeah. off the Omni study of 2010, yeah. right? And, and then the sale came, so we held because we didn't want to, mm -hmm. didn't want to yeah. not get back what we put in. So, you know, and, and we're also a year behind on the Remington Burnick, right? Mm -hmm. Remington Burnick assumed we were going to do stuff in 2017, right? That clock started already. So, how, and and now we now that we have this, I think we need to figure out. Also, we have to reopen a discussion with the DEP. Nancy, maybe if you can reach I, out. I yeah, I did that already. Okay, to to set something up to talk about that big line of I'll, I'll call right. it a line of credit where we just have to do the whole bond council thing once, mm -hmm. and then we just borrow off of that. And there was no annual fee. Mm -hmm. if, there, there use was, it right, right. Right. Don't use it right. No fee. So if I can just update you, um, uh, I did sign up for the DP. Things are done differently now. You do it online. You sign up for an online account, which I did. Um, the next step is to download documents, which I didn't think we were ready to do yet because we're not, you know, we haven't talked about exactly how you want to do this. But I did meet with um, our auditor and um, our CFO. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you what the auditor recommends, and then you know you can decide which way you want to go. Um, when we looked at the three point six million dollars for uh, what we just heard today, um, he suggested that we either bond it or, if we're approved, the DEP interest rate is a lot lower. So um, the line of credit, and as we discussed before, you're only using what you pay for. Um, it, well, it, it, I mean, you're it, only paying for what you use as you. It, use it's it. still an initial bond, right? It's the NJEIP. EIT. E e e it's well, it's like a loan of credit, a line of credit. So, if we needed, if we started out and and, you know, I don't believe that we pay the whole 3.6 at once. Let's say we just did the phosphorus tank. Well, 3.6 plus the million for the Remington Vernick. Right. Assuming we're doing a million a year. Let's well, look well at 4.6. What the auditor recommended. Right, so it so you, whether you do a line of credit or a bond for the 3.6, he recommended that you put the Remington verdict in uh, current operating. Um, so, Jeez. when he talked about uh, when you talked about how we're a year behind in Remington Vernick, um, our uh, Paul Farrar, our engineer, and Tom Sweeney recommended that we not just move everything back a year, that now we really need to do 2017 and 18 combined, um, which really ends up being $3.5 million. Um, we wouldn't have any debt service this year on the uh, line of credit or bond, however you decide to go, because so, uh, that I'm wouldn't sorry. happen. I'm sorry to interrupt. 3.5 million is the Remington Veronic recommendation? 17 and 18, the Remington Veronic. Oh, it's not and, a million a year. No, how, no. Is it, how is it 3.5? Were they? Um, higher numbers in the first two years? They they were higher numbers, and actually they're reduced a little because I asked um, Tom Sweeney to go through. There are a few things that we would not need. Right, like Be the sand filter maintenance. The sand filter, yeah. right. So he already took those off, but they end up being 3.5 for 17 and 18. Oh, wow. And I can okay. send you those spreadsheets. And, that and is that uh, operation or? Uh, no, that's for, that's, that's, cap capital? that's capital. Okay. Um, so uh, the auditor recommended you do do this in, in current, um, we already have, <coughs> in anticipation of the possibility of you enacting the sewer utility tonight, um, Randy took out uh, sewer fee, all the, all the appropriations of revenue for the sewer, separated them out, because if, if the utility gets enacted, then that's what's gonna have to happen. Um, so in there, we have two hundred eighty thousand dollars debt service, which you're going to pay one way, one way or another on the existing debt. Um, beginning next year, you would pay three hundred sixty thousand um, dollars a year in debt service. That's two hundred thousand in principal and one hundred sixty in interest. That's on the three point six or four million dollar um, bond. 
if that's uh, or line of credit. Um, those are approximates. These are all approximates. Um, Two hundred thousand dollars in the capital improvement fund, uh, which we may or may not need depending on how you fund it. And um, he also had two hundred thousand dollars in engineering consulting fees, but. Um, Tim said that all the soft costs were included in that 3.6, so that probably wouldn't be needed. But uh, ballpark um, added to what our expenses already are, our operating expenses, um, I believe, and Randy, correct me if I'm wrong, we were about at $5.2 million that we would need to raise, um, and we last year brought in $1.5 million in revenue in sewer. Um, right, so your fees would... Uh, Clearly, more than double. Um, right now, the average um, sewer user bill is $600, um, and that would easily go up to what was it in the first year? It, it was it $1,800. It, it, depending on um, how much of that you want to do, it could be between $1,800 and $2,000. Right. There are ways to. If you want to split this in between year one and year two, um, but either way, uh, the recommendation from the engineer and from the DPW director is that you take the fine <coughs> filter of 2017 and 2018 and combine into one year since we're already a year behind. Um, it's not it's not like you can just start now and but pretend it's 2017. You have to it, you have to combine them. It, it, is he suggesting? in doing both in one year, paying as you go for both of them or capitalizing uh, them or, or bonding them? Um, Ray, the auditor, is suggesting pay as you go. Um, when we spoke last week, we only did our, um, our figures on 1.5 because that was what we thought, um, you know, the 2017 was close to 1.5. Right. So he wasn't aware because I had not heard from Paul and Tom that they think we need to combine both years. I don't know that he'd feel any different because he doesn't his his philosophy, Ray's philosophy was that you shouldn't be bonding or borrowing money um, and paying for this over it's a 20 year, you know, it's a 20 year continuous I, 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 and he and he didn't yeah. think that you should be borrowing for it. Yeah. Cuz by year Ten, you're going to be in for double. <laughs> um, have a good talk. Well, so the question is, how much more do we think? Well, if I, any. I, I mean, we're, we're throwing around a lot of numbers here. Yeah. Um, I, I'd kind of like to see it on paper, so that we know a little bit more specifically what we're talking about, um, uh, because. Right now, it's a discussion. At some point, we're going to have to make some votes, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, this is this is going to be a big hit to sewer users. A big hit. Huge. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to have the numbers tightened up and and give us some kind of summary. Can can we look? Can we also look at a scenario? Um, so so we've got the one. You know, the three point six obviously is something that we're going to borrow. Um, my own personal suggestion is because you're now combining two years into one, you've got another 3.5, right? Just bond that too. You're bonding anyway, right? So now you're bonding for 7.1, and at least that eases the pain a little bit for two years. I mean, that, you know, just off the top of my head numbers, that's probably going to wind up being. 60 65 percent rate increase in the first year and then in the third year then we have to take a decision how to fund year three of Remington and Burnick right and 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 honestly at some point we have to take a look at do we feel that we think we need to do all of what Mayor Remington and Burnick says in that given year right I mean we could we could potentially push, you know, some sewer lining by one year and then do double another year. Although then the then the sewer curve gets to be like this with the rate, so that doesn't really help either. 
and, and and you know maybe the answer is borrow three years if, if we could throw some scenarios you know borrow nothing outside of the omni the Kleinfelder sorry it's not even omni Kleinfelder anymore it's just Kleinfelder sorry I'll have to get used to that um, borrow just a 3.6 for Kleinfelder then another scenario borrow a 3.6 plus two years mm -hmm. then another scenario borrow a 3.6 plus three years right and maybe even borrow a 3.6 plus four years Right, so that we have so and and do things in four year blocks and 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 just so that we can look at the numbers I mean that's going to be an expensive bond because at that point you're at nine million ten million um, yeah it, it, yeah I, I'm Maybe, maybe you can work with Nancy yeah. and Randy, yeah. and perhaps uh, Mr. Spreadsheet, uh, and you can put it in the, uh, yeah, the rest I, of us. I, I'm still that, that two hundred thousand dollars in operating for the phosphorus is killing me. Mm -hmm. Hundred forty-six. Well, plus plus the extra sludge removal because yeah. because because the fo the chemicals that they bring in actually bind to the phosphorus, so you have to put it in and then take you it out. Remove it, yeah. So, what, so whatever you're bringing in, you're you're, you're trucking away yet on top of it. Right. So, um, so it's 200 roughly. I, I think the number that Nancy had right. was close to 200 thousand dollars. I mean that that in itself is 15 percent rate increase just by itself. That doesn't count having spent any capital improvements. All right, something to digest for a meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, everyone okay, Matt, Brendan? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, we're not okay, but yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're <laughs> yeah, past, they're past, they're past that, out. You know, so you brought it up, and I, I think maybe uh, the numbers are higher still than we had yeah. thought. So it's going to take a little time to digest this. Yeah. Use the mic. Use the mic. Mike, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> All right, next, uh, and I, uh, Nancy, can you, you, you lead us on this? This is the Sterling Hotel rezoning. Uh, I think the, the owner had asked if we right, would consider we, it. We received a request from the uh, attorney for the Sterling Hotel. Um, they asked <clears throat> that the governing uh, body, that the township committee, consider uh, rezoning um, their property. They currently have uh, three lots, um, two large lots, the lot where the hotel is, the lot in the back, and then there's, they recently purchased a small lot. Um, it's a split lot, so half of it is in the B15 uh, business zone, and the back half plus the new lot are in the R4 residential zone. Um, and uh, they are looking to merge the two lots and rezone, rezone them as all business. Um, they said that the 1996 master plan recommends rezoning um, Sterling Pub, as it was called then, uh, the site to the business zone. Um, I, I believe the uh, B15 is now called the Sterling Village Zone. But anyway, that's what they want to be. They would like to, uh, it's unusual to have a split lot, and they would like to move it all to um, to business so the options are they would prefer the township committee um, discuss it first and then you're obligated to send it to planning board to make sure it's consistent with the master plan and for them to make a recommendation and then it comes back and you vote on it or you as a committee can decide the planning board should look at it first and then it has to come it, back it, here is is the is the existing lot a split lot or is the new lot that they are hoping to combine going to be a split lot? Uh, the existing lot, as I understand it, is a, is, is a split lot, the, the, the existing one. And, and, right. And, so and then half of the site is in, half the current site is in um, uh, business, 
and half, yeah, there's a map, and it, it was in your packet. And then the other half of the site, which includes the new lot, is in residential. Per perhaps and we could get our local uh, uh, right. zoning and, and uh, I was going to, expert. My, my question to Jack, and probably to Dennis as well, is if the recommendation in the 96 master plan was to do X, why wouldn't we, why uh, we, not right. we, but why would the township get and have not done so? There's, there's another, uh, is, it, is it correct that the zoning board is basically allowing the hotel to act as though to, to, to conduct business as though right. it is, is one lot in the, so in the we, business zone. Is that right? Yes, they, they appeared before the Board of Adjustment um, last year, uh, July, I believe, um, over a course of five meetings. Um, they got approvals for, uh, I think it was nine variances. Um, they have the tent out back. Mm -hmm. And because it is, it is residential, it was considered a variance. So they got approval of, I believe, all nine from the um, Board of Adjustment, and uh, now they're looking, you know, because they're not, because they had to go for a variance, now they're, it's cleaner, obviously, mm -hmm. to have the whole thing be residential. Yeah. They've already got the approval to operate. Right, they already the, So they're operating as though yes. they have the zoning right now, as I understand. But, but, as, but, but there's a variance. Okay. But, yeah. Variance, right? but, there's, yeah. A, but there's, exactly. there's a variance from the Board. So, yeah. so mm -hmm. the other question I have is, I know that the Master Plan Committee slash Planning Board is in the middle of looking at rezoning Sterling Village. Is so I was going correct? to ask Den yeah. Dennis. I'm sure you I, remember I, what what happened in '96. That's that's. Uh, I'd ask why we would want to spot rezone when we're going to talk about rezoning the whole area anyway. In answer to a few of your questions, the main lot that it contains the hotel. The southeast corner, uh, which is the, uh, as, you, as you walk out of the hotel, it's back here, is in the residential zone because apparently when somebody drew the zone lines for B1 five years ago, they continued a straight line without realizing that it cut off an L shape in the back of the lot. Because of that, being in the residential zone, <laughs> Sterling Hotel had to come to the zoning board for a whole host of variances to allow them to continue their uh, grove use on that little corner, and it was a nuisance. The new lot is on Railroad Avenue. It's the next lot back, and it is currently vacant. It's a very narrow lot. Uh, and it, it obviously has no use other than to be attached to the Sterling Hotel, and they bought it. All of this proposal has been in the land use element draft for over two years. And all of this is part of the 800 odd uh, individual zoning changes that are contemplated in the master plan. And so the opportunities you have, as I see it, are to either direct a spot zoning, uh, which you can do, uh, or hustle the master plan along and the ordinances that go with it, and a complete overhaul of the zoning map, which goes after that. Uh, it's all a question of timing. I don't know. Now that they have their variances, I'm not sure that there is a particular urgency. They can merge the lots on their own just by filing with the uh, county. They don't need our permission to do that. And so th that will leave them with a split lot in the residential, but they've already got variances to cover that. So we could do this as a one-off, or we could just let the master plan land use element take its course, your choice. Where, where, where do you think we are? I mean, I know we've talked about this every year. This year is the year, but I, I think the, the chairman of the planning board said this year is the year. Yeah, well, that's, I've heard that each year for the past four years. <laughs> uh, in fact, I even heard 2013, five years ago, as our goal. Um, I can't be sure, Mr. Mayor, when it will happen. Uh, clearly, the land use element still has some uncertainty, <coughs> if I may say that, over what to do in Millington and what to do on Main Avenue and Sterling in general. Those are still open items for discussion. 
Uh, I don't know if the master plan committee will be able to hustle those before the end of the year and then follow that up with all the ordinance changes and the zoning map change. It is also interesting to note that if we scratch our heads, we can come up with about four or five other instances in the past three years where business owners have had to go to the zoning board for variances uh, that were already contemplated for repair in the master plan land use element, which just doesn't seem to get off the yeah, ground. Yeah, yeah, your lumber was one of them, right? And so I think it's a question of uh, do you, you use a surgical knife here on the zoning map, or do you get a big gas club and go after the master plan committee? Mr. Mayor, if I could make a suggestion here. Um, perhaps uh, we could direct uh, Jack to talk to their attorney and see if waiting for the master plan till possibly the fall presents any undue hardship to them. And if it does, then we can proceed to discuss this as a one-off. If not, we wait f uh, till the fall and see if the master plan makes progress and then take this the matter up at that time. Because as a general rule, Long Hill Township I'm, and all towns don't like the spot zone. And I, I I'm not sure that the spot zone happen. and the master plan achieve the same thing. This would not really be spot zoning to bring in a property and make it a part of the larger mm -hmm. zone. So spot zoning would be a, okay. an isolated lot. Okay. Like right. We're, ju we're just we're just asking them to do something they're already doing. Correct. So, uh, okay. So see if it yeah. see if it presents a hardship. Otherwise, let's just wait till the fall and see yeah. how far along the master plan gets. Yeah. And if it's not to us by we the fall, it. we'll do it again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just as a as a point of clarification, the master plan committee is a creature of this committee. Mayor. not of the not of the planning board so the uh, attorney of the master plan committee is probably more closely defined as Jack himself rather than as Yolanta and so therefore talk to yourself if you're going to talk to anybody <laughs> <laughs> okay well all right, so I think, uh, Jack, you know. I, I will call this time. Fair enough. Let's go on to the liaison reports. Let's start with Bruce, nothing, nothing. Cornell. Nothing. Mr. Dorsey? Yes. Um, uh, on Saturday morning, or Sunday morning around 1 o'clock, there was a structure fire down by the Little League Field, back almost in the woods, the last house. Um, it was a detached garage caught fire. We don't know how the fire started. Luckily, nobody got hurt. However, thanks to the quick actions of the Long Hill firefighters, and our mutual assisting companies that come in to help out. We put it out and uh, nobody was hurt. So good job, everybody. As to the road department, um, right now they're in the middle of filling uh, potholes now. So you can report on the website if there's a pothole, the DPW will get the message directly and they will go fix it as soon as humanly possible. Um, they've recycled so far 1.5 tons of styrofoam. So great job with that, all the residents. And I remind you, we still have to fill the aluminum um, trailer for the St. Barnabas Health Center for the burn unit and also please bring your used uh, cooking oil because we want to get that thing filled up too and get that program really taken off. Um, they're also in the process of street sweeping right now obviously it's still cold and everything else but they're still out there doing it and as it gets warmer and they do the mandatory roads they'll start hitting all the roads. Um, they're still removing all the dead trees which is still a problem and an ongoing project and the, our wastewater crew, the, the guys down at the sewer department, have been, uh, obviously still a problem. They had to bypass the sand filters on three occasions this year due to the rain, and they expect to have to do it this weekend too with the heavy rain coming in. Uh, hence another reason why we need to increase the capacity. And it's only whatever, March. So thank you. Nothing from me. Okay, I, I, you know, I just have one thing. We have the, the uh, the meeting last night at the planning board, my notes are a little scribbled because I was writing them as I was driving up from South Jersey. I wanted to see if the acting chief was listening. Uh, I did not write them when I was driving, but... So there was a, a, a resident uh, who came up and spoke, um, and I think everybody knows who he is, so Joe Ferrandino, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. And I, he, he said something which resonated with me, and I'm sure it, it's, I speak for everybody up here. He said he was very angry and frustrated that the state uh, was dictating and, and you know changing the uh, character of this town. He moved out of, as you've all heard him often say, the concrete jungle 
uh, in Brooklyn, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to speak to all the residents. I, and I know I speak for everybody up here. Uh, we agree. It, it, it's wrong. We're not happy with the decision that was made. Unfortunately, we have to play the ball as it lies. That's what was dictated to us. Um, and, you know, I'm on the League Legislative Committee with uh, Committeeman Marangolo. I'm on the Conference of Mayors Legislative Committee w uh, with uh, uh, a lot of mayors. And I'm on the Morris County Executive Board. I can tell you over the last year since the decision came down, I guess it was January, Jack, of 2017, Correct. when they included the gap period, we had a credit uh, on co or we were basically in balance until that decision. Close-ish. No, we, I mean, they get hurt us, but not. Right, but so when those, when those numbers were included, um, uh, it came as a shock, not, not just to us. I mean, this is not just uh, Long Hill Township. It's not big town, small town. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. It's not affluent. It's not middle class. Uh, you know, it's almost certainly every uh, town in New Jersey is frustrated with what has happened. I can tell you the person that led the charge against this and originally wanted all the towns to fight is uh, Mayor Miranoff down in East Windsor. Uh, she's a Democrat, just to show you. Uh, this is an issue on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the Supreme Court takes a lot of beating on this, and they deserve to. Um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of lawyers that think their decision was, uh, I don't know if illegal is the word, but on shaky ground. Uh, but it's not just. Right. <laughs> and, and, and that leads me to my next point. Uh, for me, and I've had many conversations with uh, some of the assemblymen and senators in the state, uh, for me, it's the inaction on, this, on, on the legislative body that led to this. They could have prevented it. They did not. They chose not to. Uh, and here we are. Just to put some numbers to it, uh, our obligation, unmet need, however, whatever it's called, was 314 units, 314 units. Uh, and just to, you know, get a visual on that, if you use the 15% set aside for rental, that's 2,100 units that this town would have had to build. We only have 2,800 houses, and we would have been required uh, to build 2,100 uh, additional units. So what we did over the last year, and sometimes it looked like we couldn't share it with the public uh, because we couldn't. Uh, but we negotiate it, and so you sit down on a, at a table, uh, and you're on one side of the table with a pen, and the person you're negotiating with has a gun. <laughs> so what ends up happening is you listen. Uh, and through the work of Jack and uh, our planner, Jessica Caldwell, those numbers come into what you now see today, which is 54 units uh, set aside for rental and 72 for owner-occupied. Or. or, I apologize, or, or. So there's a reason we got, uh, we ended up where we are. It was from 314 units down to 54 uh, rental, which uh, frankly is a remarkable achievement considering what we were looking at. So I, I, didn't, I don't want people to think this was done uh, haphazardly. It was an awful lot of work over the course of the last year, which culminated, I think, on December 15th, uh, Morristown Su right. Superior Court, where Judge Hubner uh, accepted our plan. So last night, what came up was the idea that we had a choice about uh, rezoning the properties in question, one of, one of which is TIFA. Uh, I'm here to tell you, we don't have a choice. Well, we do have a choice. If we don't rezone uh, the TIFA property, what ends up happening is the agreement falls apart and that 314 number comes back into play. Am, am I legally? Uh, that's correct. Mayor. That's correct. So, uh, you know, I, I think the, the tone of the conversation last night was don't rezone uh, the TIFA property, the Warren property, and, and the other properties. Uh, the agreement on December 15th uh, preempts. Uh, anything we can do at this point. Uh, all we're talking about now are the uh, bulk standards, you know, setbacks, uh, height, I guess, is, or although there seems some question about height, because yeah, it's three stories, I think. Uh, but, but correct. 
the ordinance has to have those kind of bulk standards, but within the parameters set forth in the settlement agreement that's been approved by the court. So whether or not to include retail, I think Bruce mentioned that earlier. Yeah, and the court uh, doesn't really care whether there's retail. So, I mean, that, that's what I think, uh, and, and hopefully what I was going to ask and, and maybe uh, recommend to the administrator, the attorney, uh, right, we you. should put a, a tab on the website and go through the parameters now, exactly where we are. Uh, we have an expert on the planning board in environmental, he's an environmental engineer, works, uh, whatever it is, he's an expert on it. He's going to write a, a, an article for the Echoes explaining exactly how the DEP process works. We should include that on the website. I think now, I don't know if we've done as good a job as we could have, I don't know, uh, over the last few months in getting this information out to the residents, but I think it's important uh, we get that information out now uh, because sometimes in a vacuum, and especially with social media today, uh, there are things that are posted, sometimes well-meaning, other times maybe not so much, uh, but a lot of it is inaccurate. So I just wanted to uh, clear, up, <laughs> gotcha. clear up a few things. Uh, Mayor Emerita Schuler is being, <laughs> is being uh, abusive. So, um, there's a timer in front of you. Can you turn it over? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, yeah, since you've turned it I'm over. I'm going to uh, ask uh, <laughs> Acting Chief Naga to remove <laughs> Cornell Schuler. All right, so no, let's no, move on. Uh, Guy, if I could ask one question, just uh, and thanks for the for, for the background there, and and perhaps this is a, a question you can answer, Jack, or not. But the TIFA site was that was there ever a choice around the TIFA site, or was that already on the table from Fair Share? Well, well two things are, are relevant. One is that the TIFA site has been on the master plan for mixed use, including affordable housing at a density of 12 units per acre since 1996. Uh, the second thing is fair share housing. That was their prime location that they wanted us to rezone because it's near a train station. Uh, that they like, it's not technically a transit village, but they like that concept. And it was one other thing that Don Richardson mentioned uh, last night, that when the DEP approved the ACA, which is the sale of, of the property, it's almost a de facto approval of something being done on that site. They, they wouldn't have approved the sale, is that, is that? No, they're two different tracks. Uh, you know, the fact that DEP approved it doesn't require the township to do it. What requires the township to do it is the Supreme Court, uh, ultimately. But, I mean, you can get DEP approvals for a wetlands, you know, waiver. Uh, but that doesn't mean the town has to grant Except if it's on Valley Road. Yes. <laughs> well, it, was, it, was, it was a hypothetical. But, but my point is the Too fact soon, Cornell. <laughs> the, the fact is that the fact that DEP grants an approval for an environmental permit of some sort doesn't require the township to grant development approvals. The, the, the applicant needs both. They're two separate tracks. Okay. So anyway, thank you. Any uh, questions for Jack? Uh, your, okay. So let's move on to the consent agenda. Uh, any resolutions anyone would like to we, we were We were pulling 18-087. Um, uh, we got to uh, change the contract language a little bit in that one, so that one's being pulled. So I'll move. I, 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 hang, hang, hang that thought. I have a question. Um, I wanted, and I completely forgot today, Nancy, while we were sitting with the CFO, I, I wanted a little to understand the math breakdown of 15-0010, the lien redemption. Oh, 086, 18086 is yeah. the resolution uh, Sorry, number. 086, I gave the lien number, sorry. I apologize. So I'm gonna ask Randy, uh, who is a the, certified tax collector to explain that because it's a complicated- the, There's answer. a lot of money moving back and forth and I just see us writing checks for more than I think we took in. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Randy Barr from Supply Clooney and Company. Uh, yeah, the lien redemption was originally sold for $552, which is the first number you see in the, in the ordinance, in the resolution. Uh, it was sold back in uh, 2015. The purchaser also paid a $21,000 premium to get that. So the certificate was sold at 0% and town got a $21,000 premium to hold. Uh, if it's redeemed within five years, it, the premium goes back. If it's not, it could be escheated to the township. 
the homeowner came in and redeemed the lien that started off at $552 for $43,000. The lien holder paid subsequent uh, tax payments and sore payments that were added to the lien. So the money that we're returning is the uh, redemption amount in the amount of $43,000 and the premium in the amount of $21,000. So we collected all, we collected the, not 43 because there's interest included, but we collected what is owed to the township at the time those taxes were coming due. Okay, so the outstanding taxes was originally $552.70. Right, which was a sewer, which was a sewer charge. Which was the sewer charge. The owner wound up having to pay forty-three thousand. Correct. Because at that point, the lien holder received. No, no, there were additional charges that accrued. The lien, the lien holder came in and paid the taxes that were unpaid by the property. Which, which was the five hundred fifty-two dollars. No, 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 that's no. a sewer bill. It's no, no. forty-three thousand. It's a forty-three thousand. Originally, they got the certificate for the sewer of the five fifty-two. The homeowner has a right every quarter to pay current charges. Once okay. the tenth comes around and it's not paid, the lien holder has a right to come in and pay that. And the reason they do is they get eighteen percent interest on that money and pays the town and adds that amount to the lien. She, she was delinquent in the amount of $43,000 plus by the end Bottom of the line, yes. scenario. So the 553 is the confusing part because there were subsequent taxes and sewer charges, I guess, that accrued. Okay, so, so, the so they paid the 43000 all along. The lien holder, correct. The lien and now, holder. And so then when she came in and paid us, now we have to reimburse the lien holder. Correct, because we have our money from the lien holder. We have our money. Right, That's, we're not losing money. Okay, <laughs> because I just saw us take, taking in, taking out, and I never saw any taxes being no. paid. So, okay, I, I got it now. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Randy. Also, did we, Jack, were we going to add? The, yes, the, was, okay. was that the uh, consensus to add hiring of three specials? No, it's not here. Okay. Right, it wasn't here. No, it's not here, but we discussed <laughs> it briefly. I, I don't have a number. I don't have any... What, what am I proposing? It's the resolution. It was the resolution for Giant. the three new special you officers. Right. Why, don't we, why don't we take it, it separately? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So move resolution 18-01 through 18-086, 18-088, and 18-089, as stated in the agenda. We are not uh, uh, approving 18-087. At Second. this moment. Second. Second, yep. Committeeman Norigolo? Yes. Committeeman Ray? Yes. Committeeman Schuller? Yes. Deputy Mayor Dorsey? Yes. And Mayor Sir Jack? Yay. <laughs> Yay. Okay, yes. So, Jack, do you want to verbalize a resolution for three? Yes, the proposal is to hire three Class two specials at an hourly rate of $20 per hour, uh, they would be on call basically at the request of the chief of police or his designee. Uh, and those three individuals as recommended by the officer in charge are Brian McGuire, Christopher Geraci, and Kyle Place. Uh, that's acceptable to you. I did prepare a resolution uh, which I've emailed to the clerk. Um, so this would be 18-090? Yes. So moved as stated by our township attorney. Second. Second. And just, just for the record, the, the resolution recites all the relevant statutes with respect to special police officers. Are you sure you don't want to read the whole thing, Jack? <laughs> oh, I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Committee Ray? Yes. Committee Ray? Yes. Committee Schuler? Yes. Deputy Mayor Dorsey? Yes. Mayor Pasercia? Yes. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, there's some of, uh, there are some appointments to boards and commissions for 2018. Uh, to the Master Plan Committee, Tom Malinowski, Pamela Ogdens, and I apologize, Bob, if I get this incorrectly. Uh, Bob Lavarario. <laughs> there you go. Uh, what you said. Um, uh, Township Committee uh, appointments, uh, a way out task force, which we've talked about many times, and it was, in fact, on the consent agenda this evening. Uh, Edwin Acevedo, uh, school superintendent, uh, Guy Pesercia, Mayor, Brendan Ray, committeeman, uh, Lieutenant Naga, uh, officer in charge, uh, and Lieutenant Ciambriello, 
uh, Lieutenant uh, Alexis Ambriello as well. So that's great. And on the Shade Tree Commission, we have uh, Gordon Redgate. So we need a motion. So why, why do we need a motion for Gordon? Oh, I apologize. So I need a motion. So, so move. So move. All right. Second. Second. <laughs> Committeeman Moringa. Yes. Committeeman Ray. Yes. Committeeman Schuler. Yes. Deputy Mayor Dorsey. Yes. And Mayor Pasercio. Uh, yes. So, uh, second reading adoption township. Wait, wait, can we go back a second? Actually, that motion is to make the way out appointments as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, it says, my bad. It says township committee appointments. Yeah, but then it says does hereby appoint Gordon Redgate. Oh, it should say both. So it should say both. Okay. So, just so the record's That's clear. Thanks. Good catch, Thank Jack. Thank you, yeah. Do you, you don't need another vote, do you? No. Okay. No, no. So, uh, second reading, Township of Long Hill, Ordinance Number 408-18, an ordinance establishing the Township Wastewater Treatment System as a municipal public utility effective January 1, 2018. Uh, so, this is second reading. I think, uh, does anybody want to discuss it? Yeah, I... I like to actually a couple of comments about this um actually more just bringing some things to the table just to make sure we're making an informed decision um if if we move and and perhaps maybe the cfo can um answer um a question about this if if we move the sewer to a completely separate utility um are we able to transfer money from the municipal budget into the sewer utility without expecting a recoupment? So the, the reason I ask that is while I'm you know, one of the more staunch supporters of if you use it, pay for it, um, the wastewater treatment plant is ultimately a capital asset of all the taxpayers in Long Hill. If, you know, if we start putting the burden onto just all the sewer, sewer payers, how do we in the future potentially recoup the opportunity cost for people who are no longer contributing into the system and suddenly connecting into a fully up, fully functional sewer system? Yeah, the problem right. with that yeah, the problem with that logic though, of course. Case, case in point, potentially TIFA. Right? We're we're going to be, you know, if if only ratepayers wind up paying for this, we will lose and and granted the timing of the TIFA property is, a, you know, very short, but in the future there will be other lots that this will happen to. Mm -hmm that there'll be other lots that will not have contributed to the upgrade of the infrastructure which they own, right? Yet when it comes time to build 200 houses, they can just plug right in. But they'll have, yeah, to, but they'll have the, to pay the $10,000 connection yeah, fee. Uh, $10,000 is inconsequential when you're talking about $10 million in hard upgrades, right? But, but isn't it our duty, right, to have a fully functioning system? As a, as a municipality, just to have it, so... But, it, I, and that, right. I, but, that, but that's my point, right? But, that, but can I ask a question, Randy? Won't the connection fee go way up if, in fact, the debt service well, my, increases exponentially? Yeah, my, my understanding, the, the connection fee is, ba is related directly to the cost and improvements of your system. Right. Uh, we, we discussed, um, and I didn't get a time to look up that statute that the, uh, okay. you had mentioned a maximum of 10 of 10-2. I don't, I don't. No, no, no. It, it's a formula. Okay. Yeah, it, that, it's a that formula. takes into account debt service in the prior year, I believe it is. Right, and you should you should be doing that but formula every year. They do. Okay. okay. It's but, increased every okay. year. But it, but it's only the current debt service, right? So once Correct. that debt service falls off, we lose the ability to recoup. Well, at that point in time, if they connect, they'll be users. Right, but they'll be connecting to a system that the rest of the people spent $20 million on. And, and, and I'm not so, so what happens to that vacant lot that happens to have a sewer in the street and somebody builds a house there and connects to the sewer with that new house development? Do they then, are they then required to pay the people who built the system in 1930? I mean, 
-hmm. It's a new house. Yeah. It, they're going to connect. And they're going to be paying right, for but, the upkeep. But, but, uh, but, uh, no, I, on. I, I understand. But, and, and, then, and then one thing that came apparent, right? My, my concern is actually the other side of this coin, right? You now have 12% of the town, is it roughly, that is not a sewer user, right? But they still own 12% of the asset. Th and that was... Right? So now yeah. we're improving the sewer plant, spending That's millions and millions of dollars, but that 12% is not contributing to the asset that they right. own. It, it, it's an asset, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, uh, and the classic right. example is when we were talking about selling the sewer plant, right? The revenue wouldn't have just gone to the 88% of the sewer users, right? We would have paid down the sewer debt. And then the balance of the $7 million that was remaining would have gotten distributed to every taxpayer in town, yeah. whether they were a sewer user or not. Yeah, but the if, th if, this, no. if this mechanic had been in place from the beginning, the taxpayers, the, the other 12%, would have gotten bonus. Yeah, well, hold on a second. The problem with that logic is for 50 years or however long, the 12 no, let me finish. The 12% were paying. They've already paid for that. And as we heard during uh, whatever, not testimony, but uh, commentary from uh, the representatives from NJ American Water, houses that are connected to a sewer as opposed to a septic or whatever go up in value 10, 15 percent. So this upgrade to the sewer system is not benefiting them. They're not getting any kick. I, un I understand the, the that. The benefit of these upgrades go entirely to the people that use it. Or will use it in the future. True. Right? It's, a, it's, it's partially the discussion of us having to do this is in large part about growth. True. Right? And we're going to take that future growth equation out of the cost well, structure. I, I actually I, don't agree with that. I mean, if we didn't have a gun to our head from the DEP, we might not do anything. That's a fair point, too. Right? So it's not well, necessarily no, we, driven no, we by would, growth. No, we would have to because we'd still have a COA obligation, right? We have two guns to our head. We've got a DEP gun on the left and a COA gun on the right. Right, right? but if, two if, if we had the capacity, we, we wouldn't be doing I, anything. I'm, I'm not suggesting keeping a wholesome burden on the taxpayer because, you know, like I said, I'm a staunch supporter of those people that are using it the most well, should be paying for it. Mm -hmm. But I think there needs to be, if there's a way for us to do it, there needs to be some mechanism for us to recognize that that ultimately is a capital asset of the ta of all the taxpayers of Long Hill, whether you use it or not, and there's an inherent opportunity cost with that, just like there's people in town that never set foot in the park. There's people that don't send kids to school. But they paid for the park, or they, but then maybe they've got four kids in school where somebody else doesn't have anybody in school, right? Every, you know, you're not going to necessarily use everything well, in the town that you're paying tax dollars on, but you might use more here, but less here. It, it's, a, it's a small survey, but the three towns I spoke with were very clear. The non-sewer users do not pay anything into the sewer system. It was Wharton, Mount Arlington, and I guess it was just well, a borough. What's their, that's a what's, small sample What's size. their percentage? Is, that's a, I don't I mean, know the I mean, answer. they could be at 50. I do in not know the answer to that. I mean, maybe we can get, uh, you can call the league and ask them what the standard practice is. I don't so, know. But isn't a, a, a play to, a, a pay to play, essentially, right, where you're, where it you're is, using it? It is, it, but right? the, prob the problem is, is you can buy in at any time. Right. With, with, the, with the sewer utility, right? So you're buying into, and, yeah, and I'm not talking about making it a perfect science, right? I'm just talking about maybe there's a way that we say, okay, maybe a certain number of, a certain amount of money stays on the municipal budget that all the taxpayers pay. So, and, I, and I'm just throwing a number. I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. this to be the number. I'm just throwing a number as an example, right? We have a $1.4 million budget, right? As, forget all the other stuff that we might have to do. Maybe the answer is, let's just put $150,000 from the municipal budget every year, 10%, or $140,000, 10% goes from municipal that 100% of the taxpayers pay, and the remaining 90% gets paid for by the users of the system. It, it can be that simple. Yeah. I mean, can we do that? And, that, and that's a question right. for Randy, whether or not that we can, you know, before, whether or not we can do that. You can certainly budget a line item to, in the current budget to give over to the utility. The one thing you want to be careful about with that is that it is 
under the appropriations cap. It's not excluded from the cap. So whatever numbers you choose or increase, mm -hmm. it could affect your appropriation cap elsewhere where you may want to do other things. Debt service would be outside the cap in, in, in the uh, municipal budget. So there would be an advantage, if you will, uh, if mm -hmm. you want to do a capital improvement, do it through the current budget and pay for it in the current budget as opposed to even putting it in the sewer utility. There you have an outside the cap advantage where it doesn't affect the cap. R Randy, are you, are you f familiar with any other towns that have a utility and how do they do it? I, I worked in Montgomery Township down in southern um, Somerset County and, and very unique to yours, uh, although they had, they had their own treatment plants, they had four different treatment plants. Um, everything was in the sewer utility in the capital. Uh, they have a larger, they uh, probably still do, have a larger than 12% uh, septic. Um, so, but they keep everything in the um, sewer utility. So the, is it a utility or an authority? That is a utility. Okay. And where I live in, in Hillsborough Township, I happen to be on septic and well, there, that is an authority, and he, obviously the authority owns the assets mm -hmm. of those treatment right. plants and everything. So back to Montgomery, do the non sewered people pay anything for the sewer? Uh, they did not. They did they, not. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming at one time when it was maybe a combined budget. Right. You know, Which, same they, with us. They did yeah. at one yeah. point, but uh, once they broke it out, everything we did as far as capital and so forth, and they had a major upgrade uh, to what we called the Pike Run treatment plant um, to the tune of six, seven million dollars, which what was put into the sewer utility and became part of that um, formula to uh, increase the connection fees to that plant. Right. See, I mean, I don't think we should reinvent the wheel. If, if, if the standard practice, and I don't know that to be the case, so now it, we're up to a uh, small sample size of four. The four that I know of do not charge the non-sewered people for uh, sewer use. You may come up with the next 50 that all do. I don't know. Uh, but as I said, Wharton, Mount Arlington, Chester Borough, and now Montgomery do not. That, that, that's the only yeah. point that I'm making. I, I, so just, I don't have. I, I just wanted to make sure that we're kind of considering mm -hmm. that. I, I know we, we, because I know this committee and myself included have been striving to get, to try and get that plant to 100% mm -hmm. sure. pay as you go. And in looking at this ordinance of, uh, or of, uh, 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 separating to the sewer utility, I tried to, you know, what's the scenario if this flips, right? What happens 40 years from now when there's a lot and somebody puts up 200 houses and they've not been contributing, suddenly they're just plugging in and they haven't chipped in, right? That, that's as unfair as yeah, but, it is yeah. for non-users today to, largely subsidized that's why that's why i'm suggesting maybe it's a number like 10 percent. maybe it's a number like i, I don't know we'd have to but isn't that somebody, require some deeper discussion isn't, isn't somebody paying twice under under, under that scenario no yeah. why but you're putting and then i'm paying it for somebody like no me. but 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 you no, but you're not you're not adding you're not adding 10 percent out you're you're so so if your expenses were a million dollars you would keep a hundred thousand on the municipal budget, and then you would only sewer collect nine hundred thousand. All right, I see. Yeah, you're, you're, yep, you're not. I'm, I'm not suggesting double dipping. I'm. I'm. I'm what mm. you take out, you reduce on this side. Right. It, it becomes. It, it effectively becomes a revenue source for the sewer utility, in addition to the user revenue. It could be. It could be a situation where. Um, you have uh, the non-tax paying or the non-sewer paying entities uh, uh, being funded out of the municipal budget. For, you know, for example, the fire departments, first aid squad, the schools—they don't pay sewer bills, right? So, as a utility, essentially, the sewer users are subsidizing the non-sewer users for their bills. And that's another one, right? We've got we've got all these places that 
Well, actually, you, you just brought up something. What happens now to the schools that it, if we go to a utility? We control it. We can decide to charge them or well, not charge you know, right them. Now, I, would, I would think nothing changes. Right, right now, right. they don't get bills, so the sewer users would be bearing the cost of those the places, schools. and the non-sewer users that, that, would that's not. That's interesting. For example, right? do, does town hall pay? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. The library, right. the town so, hall, so, first aid. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting. So, so if you, so, 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 I, I think if, if we're allowed to push money back and forth between the two, right? I, I don't need think we need to figure out the number. Now it's enough for us to know that we can do it. <laughs> well, this, 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 this. To be fair to this committee, uh, I didn't know about this comment until tonight. I don't know if you guys did. Mm -hmm. Jack, if, if we were to pass this, mm -hmm. can we amend it just as quickly? In, well, we're not, in a we're, month? Not, we're not setting financial budget on this, no. right? This is yeah. the, 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 just creating the utility. We're just All right, creating so, the utility. So I think if, the, if, we, if we're sure from your perspective and from your perspective that the answer is yes, that we can move money back and forth, then, then my. Well, we my moving money back and forth, we're allocating it at the outset. Well, at the beginning of the year, every year right. we would do correct. this, right? Correct. If you have the option, you right. just want you to have the, the option, option, right? So we don't have to figure out what the number is right now. We may wind up saying no, the heck with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, it's like a philosophical question, right? right? It's a philosophical question, well, yeah. but but at least it it if the answer was no, we'd be making a much harder choice right now as to whether Fair or enough. not we really want to make that part of a decision. So I'm glad that the answer is yes, that we can do it, and we, I'm okay with and, Let's and, figure and it you, out later. you use mm -hmm. a 50-year tenor. So, I mean, the truth is, we're all going to be long gone. No, we are. But, so but, if the but, future but our, but our properties are here, right? And, and it's, a, it's about the property. Having no, no, no. I, that's not, why I'm not agreeing us with as you. as an individual, because we could be gone tomorrow. Hopefully not. <laughs> You're getting very philosophical. <laughs> Existentialist. So if I could just note that you do need to have that conversation sooner rather than later. Oh, yes, we do, yeah. because that means it would be part of the budgeting process. Great. Okay, but that's not for tonight. We can, we can act, well, uh, this is second reading, so. But open, <coughs> open it to the public. Open to the yeah, public. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, uh, as long as there's no other comments from mm -hmm. the committee, I'd like to open uh, <clears throat> the meeting to the public on this ordinance only. Charles Arenowitz, Millington. At the first meeting, I was not permitted to ask any questions. But apparently tonight, the public is allowed to speak. Thank you for that opportunity. I asked the question in the open meeting, why haven't we done this since 1920? And Mr. Marangolo told me he was only 52. That's right. I thought that was very good of him to tell me his age. <laughs> but the question remains, why are we doing this now? Could each of you explain to me why we're doing it now? Starting with Mr. Dorsey. I will defer my time to the chair. Mr. Ray. We're doing this because uh, of the amount of money that we need to spend in order to do the work that we're, that, that we're, that we're doing to the uh, um, wastewater treatment plant. And we want to be able to somehow uh, keep, it on, keep ourselves uh, right under the budget cap. Let's go to Mr. Schuler. So that is, I'll, I'll echo Mr. Ray's sentiment. That is, you know, there is a three and a half you know, a 2% appropriations cap, 3.5% because we have a cap bank. Um, so we are limited in what we can do if this remains on the municipal budget and not separated. And, you know, as we spoke earlier, you know, we're talking about financing $7.1 million mm -hmm. on, a, on a good day. Mm -hmm. um, Yep, that's a million dollars a year of debt service, and that's at 
you know, on a $15 million budget, that's going to blow the 3.5% limit very quickly. Mr. Marangolo is 52 years old of age. It, 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 Your Chuck, are, are we being graded on these answers? Yes. <laughs> Ditto. You haven't heard the half of it yet. <laughs> Ditto. Mayor Peshera. Well, everything that they said, but also in my mind to correct uh, a wrong. Um, for example, the people in Myersville, of which I'm one, full disclosure, uh, when all of us bought our homes there, it was with the understanding that Myersville would be sewered by no later than 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, as my good friend Mr. Sandow pointed out, he figures 37 years is uh, long enough uh, to fulfill maybe. A, a promise. The only way it was ever going, going to get uh, honored was if the sewer sale had passed, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at a situation where 12% uh, of the town, and it wasn't always the people that are currently in those properties, uh, but to your point, going back to 1920, uh, it would appear now that they'll never get sewered. And if that's the case, I think it's time that uh, those people stop uh, paying a sewer bill for uh, a sewer system that they're never going to use. I, I, I can add something to this. And it's secondhand. I, I, I didn't reach here yet. I was just. Oh, I don't vote. Go so. ahead. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you how I'd vote. <laughs> I, I was, I, I, I'll also add, if I could, it also makes the accounting a hell of a lot easier. Right? We, we, we have been, you know, for at least the past six or seven years, been attempting to bill out fairly accurately or as accurate as we can um, what it costs to run the sewer plant, and we've been trying to bill those sewer users. Right. By having mm -hmm. it completely off on a budget line, uh, on a completely separate budget, we literally now can account to the, you know, to the hour of the to person, penny, yeah. to the penny, mm -hmm. right? A a instead of keeping a side spreadsheet, right? And and as we saw in the budget meeting today, there were probably one or you know a couple of costs that we hadn't been getting, you know, completely right. Some were high, some were low, you know. We missed some, but nothing of significance, and, right? And, but but uh, now it's now it's got its own general and, ledger. And to Cornell's Done. point, we're, we're not reinventing this. This started yeah, back this in is, 08. Yeah. And then it was finalized under Mayor yep. Harrington in yep. 11, I think it was. So yep. it's actually not our idea. It's our idea to put it into we, the utility because of the cap. Yep. Yeah, but here's the question. How long has the cap been in place? Uh, since uh, Governor Christie, Christie came in. 2012. Okay. Oh, well, so sorry. why didn't we do this if we knew in 2010 we had a $20 million INI investment plus others? Why didn't we do it eight years ago? Chuck, I got to be honest with you, and I think uh, we were all sobered up just a little bit. You say we knew. Uh, we heard about uh, expenses tonight that we didn't even know when we went out to. Uh, to, to the referendum. Uh, well, we, so we, 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 I, we had an idea. We knew but, there was going to be eight, yeah. and, and some of us on this committee were around when we debated that, and we, all, we decided only to chew off 4.4 or whatever the yeah. bond was, 4.5. Yeah. Well, right. the interesting thing, when I'm sitting at home tonight, I'm listening to our experts telling us, why are we investing in I&I? &I? And I've heard for the past six years we need to stop I and I. It's overflowing our plant. They tell us tonight, don't invest in I and I. Expand the plant. No, Could they didn't someone say that. Chuck, explain Chuck, that? Oh, as, as Did as I home. misinterpret that? You, you misinterpreted oh, that. Totally. Tell me, clarify it. They said invest in the plant and do I and I. Yeah. They, at the, at the bottom. I don't know if otherwise I have you're running in place. Yes. I saw the 3.8 million that said invest in the plant, and I was watching a game, Mayor. That Which game? Irish. Finally came back with Bonsi Golson tonight. Oh, he's and back. Beat Pitt, so we're trying to make he, it in. He's healthy. He's healthy. Healthy. So tonight. he's here for the tournament. Okay. So did I misinterpret something on that presentation? Yeah, yes. No. There, yes, well, I could have been confused, like I said, with the game. So I was trying there, to do there, both. There, there, he was very clear to point out that, you know, doing this, you must also continue to do I and I remediation. Okay. Otherwise. The, the leakage is going to continue to get worse, okay. right? Because he pointed out that we we, yeah. we actually did 4.6% or so of INI remediation, yet 
we saw no measurable improvement over the past eight years, and that's because what they call I and I creep. The stuff that we didn't fix got right. worse equal to what we fixed. Yeah, that's right. so we, we absolutely have to continue investing Good. in I&I. We're doing I. both. Okay. I thank you for all your input individually on this question. I still, in my mind, even though I'm watching this game, saying, why didn't we do this sooner? So you can sleep on that tonight, and tomorrow morning when you shave, you say, geez, Chuck asked me, why didn't we do it sooner? I'm going to come up with a better response the next time. Thank you. <laughs> so we are being graded. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other members of the public? I apologize. <clears throat> just like to ask you to keep separate in your mind what that 12% number means. The 12% is the percent of residences in town which don't have a sewer connection. That's not the, the taxpayers, right. because we have the business taxpayers and 100% of the businesses are on the sewer system. So maybe you're talking about eight or nine percent of the taxpayer mm -hmm. base, but some of the commercial uh, sewer users are huge users, particularly the, the more popular restaurants uh, are right on the top of the list. And some of the commercial users are extremely small users. A, a very small shop that only has a potty in the back and doesn't do any bathing. So there is a wide, a, a wide variance in how the commercial users use the sewer system uh, to the extent that we're talking about the sewer users funding the utility through their regular fees you really need to look at how much the big users, the small users, and the residential users plow into that but versus the non-sewered residences off on the side. Uh, it, it, it won't come out to 12%, but it will be somewhere in that ballpark. It, well, it's, a, it's actually, right, it, it's not really 12% either, right, because it's only 12% of the existing structures that are insured. 12% well, right? we of the existing housing units. Right, right. We, well, so, there's a so, difference between a structure and a housing unit. Okay, a housing unit, okay. Yeah, apartments, right. houses, I'm, for I'm example, actually, are counted. I'm actually talking more about in, you know, getting revenue or some level of revenue from an empty lot that someday will have the opportunity to plug into the system and become a sewer user. What about the lot that used to have a house on it but is now an empty lot thanks to Blue Acres? Well, we, we, I mean, we're extracting our open space out yeah. of that, right? But there are a number of developable lots in town, right, that if you move this completely off book, you lose any source of contribution revenue to what it costs to put a sewer plant in so that when they suddenly do build a house, it's there for them. Let's talk about that $10,000 number, more or less, that is in the ordinance uh, yeah. now. Uh, that, that is specifically aimed at connectors since a magic year, 1989, I think. 86, I think it is. December okay. 1st, 86. Whatever. Yeah. Any house that existed prior to that date, which is now connecting, only has to pay $400. They have to pay $10,000. Because the presumption is that house was paying all along, all along yep. Yep. whereas the house that was built after the magic date, the $10,000 was, in fact, the catch-up number. Right. There, there, there's a bunch of dynamics, and we're not going to figure out the mathematics of it tonight by any measure, but just knowing that we can potentially make a movement of money. On the other hand, 
When I build a house and connect my electricity and my telephone and my cell phone and my water and my cable TV, I don't have to pay a premium for the investment that those utilities have made prior to my building a house. Well, let's go. Did you want to that, remember the public? On, it, yeah, it's on that topic about the commercial. Oh, okay, sure. I'm um, sorry, Nancy. Yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, when we had our discussion with the auditor, I brought up the difference. Is there a different rate charge for commercial versus um, residential? Because as you mentioned, particularly residents place a much higher burden on the um, restaurants, rather, pay a much higher burden on the sewer system. Um, especially if they don't clean their grease traps enough, things like that. So um, I was told that there is a difference in a flat fee. I guess you pay a, fel a flat fee in addition to your um, per gallon usage. Mm -hmm. So the residential flat fee is lower than the commercial, but only by about $135. Um, and in addition, just as a FYI, I, you've never talked about, there are 97 residents who have a sewer with a well. So they have a split. Um, yeah, yeah, no, right. we, we, yeah, they paid uh, it 200 or, or it's going to be more now. Right. So um, anyway, I asked, uh, the auditor suggested that if you were interested um, in doing a rate study for commercial versus residential rates, um, you might want to do that. Because I mean, it's a given. I, I think everybody's aware that commercial, and again, particularly restaurants, put a much bigger burden on the sewer system than residences so um the price was minimal got teenagers <laughs> no it, uh, it, it it's it's the contents of what they put in that right the biologics are much easier to to get rid of believe it or not but when they start putting all their cleaning chemicals in they've got like she said they got grease that goes down in there that doesn't you could you couldn't let bruce's witty yeah. comment stand <laughs> could you so it, it's Sorry. something you may want to consider. Uh, the cost was minimal. Um, I know he gave us what his cost was. I, I can't remember the exact amount, but it was not a lot. Um, I, and there are other people that do I, those kind of studies. So I, I think everyone is going to need to, uh, you know, on the committee is going to need to have to take a close, hard look at the existing rate structure and consider what the new rate structure might be we may want to take a position that we increase the flat fees more than the usage fees simply because these are capital improvements and not operational mm. improvements uh, you know there's a lot of dynamics yeah. that we can do You're right um you know Split i know I, I know the bill usage dennis and, and did, improvements dennis did a lot of work on the current rate structure um <laughs> that knowledge base a little bit <laughs> we have a wastewater committee would you like to I'm be on it about a pricing committee, not a wastewater committee. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get above the floor <laughs> <laughs> um, so so yeah there's there's right. you know charge commercial more right how do how do we deal with well users you know if it, it we may have to have we may have to have a discussion about requiring a meter Right, that's been discussed in the past before. Right. A, a meter on the on the on the sewer so that we can't average a well user anymore because, frankly, now we're just talking. It's too much money. Right. Uh, you know. So there's tons Some of things. Some people may that, benefit. Some people may benefit uh, yeah, from right. Meter. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. That's right. You, I, we know each other, but would you say your name and address? <laughs> sure, Pam Ogens and Millington. Um, there was a letter in the Echo Sentinel uh, to the editor from Neil Lorber, and it was about, um, as I read it, a line of credit from the state at an mm -hmm. interest rate of less than 1%. Correct. Can you just briefly explain to me and, and residents what that means, sure. what that impact's going to be in, in our financing these huge so, so we, improvement sure. costs. So, so we've leveraged that um, funding source before. It's the New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure Trust Fund. Um, and they have 
they've managed to secure some incredible financing rates um, that I think currently they're talking is, is, is around 0.9 percent. Um, I mean that if, if we can borrow money, right, we still have to pay back the principal, right? But when you're calculating interest on $10 million amortized over 10 years, there's a big difference between 0.9% and 3% um, in terms of what your payments are. So, you know, we're obviously as a committee going to look for the best possible funding sources. And in the discussions that we had with DEP in December, they seem to indicate that they might even be able to open up, for lack of a better term, a, a, a line of credit because they're aware of the Omni study, they're aware of the Remington Vernick study and the ongoing expenses that both of those represent and, and the large expenses. So they could almost pre-approve us for the bulk of the work and then each year we just tap off as we go if we, if we decide to do it that way versus a pay as you go or maybe it's a hybrid or there's a lot to be determined about the financing. But, but it, it is available to us. It, it is available to us. And, and the interest rate changes, right? So as the interest rates go up, that, that may be one. I, I think the one we have now that we secured in 2013 one, was something like 1.9% nine, yeah. or okay. something like that, So it, it, which was way below market then. Um, so we've leveraged them before multiple times. We'll leverage them again for as long as they're available. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the good news is the interest rate's lower. Right. But the yep. bad news is, as uh, Mr. We, we have to pay out, you still have to pay back. <laughs> like a mortgage. If we it's give you a mortgage at 0%, you still have to pay back oh, the yeah. mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, let's see, there was another question I had. Also, if you're considering outsourcing uh, just the management part mm -hmm. of the sewer works, for comparison, would you want to look at what the labor costs would be if you got that department up to where it should be, so that you would factor yeah, in? Yes, yeah, we, we, we absolutely will do that. Yeah, it'll, it'll be an, it'll be as close to an apples. Yeah, because apples. Yeah, if you use it just yeah. at three employees, obviously yeah. that's not a fair yeah. comparison. Right. Yeah. Um, just a quick word, if you can explain with the fair share. My understanding that the um, the hearing for sites were. Um, were approved. And I don't want to, do you, do you have a little bit more time tonight? Because what we'll do is get through this real quickly. It's not going to take much longer, probably five minutes, 10 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to the public on any topic. And that would be that topic. Sure. Is and that okay? Best, the spelling of my name is wrong. Okay. <laughs> Give me the correct one. It's O-G-E-N-S. Everybody wants to put a D in there. Uh, great. Thank you. O-G-E-N-S? O-G-E-N-S? Yeah. Would you like to buy a D? <laughs> if I can win Wheel of Fortune or whatever that is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a vowel that you buy. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other member of the public? Okay, so at this point, I'm looking for a motion. So moved. Second. Committeeman Maringolo. Yes. Committeeman Ray. Yes. Miniman Schuler. Yes. Deputy Mayor Dorsey. Yes. Mayor Pasercio. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to old business. Wait, we did the second ordinance. Oh, what did I? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Page 11. I've never minute. understood why they were separate, but it doesn't matter. So ordinance uh, number... 409-18, an ordinance providing that the sewer use charges and sewer connection fees shall be paid into the township's municipal public sewer utility and amending chapter 22 of the township code entitled sewers. Now this is second reading as well. Jack, you want to explain this? Yes, as best I can. The, the, the current ordinance, and, and I think this ordinance casts some light on the history of this whole thing. Uh, the, the current ordinance provides that the purpose of this article is to dis disestablish the sewer utility in the township. And, and that ordinance is Ordinance 279. I checked my old code book and I think it was adopted in 1967. But 
it was before my time, but I know the township had a non-binding referendum in the late 60s or early 70s, I believe it was actually the late 60s, probably when this ordinance was adopted. Mm -hmm. And the question was whether sewer improvements should be financed through the users or through general taxation. But the plan at that time, as I understand it, was to sewer the entire town. And as the mayor has pointed out, that, that was done for a while and then it stopped uh, before it got to certain areas of town. Uh, so, so that's why in the late 60s, the, <coughs> the utility, which had been in effect, and I have no idea how long, was disestablished. So the purpose of this ordinance is really just to clean up that language since you've reestablished a sewer utility, is to say the purpose of this article is to confirm the creation of a municipal uh, public sewer utility. Okay. So, so there was a utility. At so, least we had, the, so we had, had a, a sewer utility. That, Chuck, we had a utility. There you go. <laughs> I tried to answer before, but Chuck wouldn't let me. <laughs> so now I can think about something else while I'm shaving tomorrow. Uh, so th that's all this is doing is cleaning that up so that we, we don't say that the purpose of the, the ordinance is to disestablish the, the sewer utility since there is, in fact, a sewer utility again. But, but that is some of the, as I say, it's all secondhand, but that's my understanding. Of, okay, uh, but in either, either, either case, it, it cleans it up. Correct. So um, did we open it to the public not yet? yet? No, not yet. Okay, so any... any Comments from the committee? Uh, open it up to the public. Chuck's coming up here to apologize to our esteemed <laughs> council. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I, I suspect when not. Was that year? 62, he said. 67, 67, I believe it was. Charles Aronowitz, Millington. The question is based on this discussion, were monies in the past for sewer connections and sewer charges not? allocated towards the maintenance or the fees towards the sewer plant? For years they were allocated towards the operation costs, but not the capital improvements. So the, the sewer users paid their, their user fees, but all of the bonds were by the township and paid by all residents of the township. So if I paid whatever it was, 10000 or $8,000 to hook up to the sewer system, where did that money go? But, but that's why, if, if I can just backtrack a little, that's why the, the section that Dennis referenced earlier, the December 1st, 1986, if your house was in existence as of that date, you only pay $400 and not the 10000 And the rationale behind that was that those people had been paying for the capital improvements over the years, even right. though they weren't connected, so they weren't paying user fees. But now that ordinance is really obsolete. Uh, because those people, to some extent, won't be paying in in the future. So it's another thing that should be looked at. Okay, so if I had a connection prior to 1986... No, not a connection, just a... Okay, well, if I built a new home and some of these things got approved in the last five years and paid whatever it is, eight or ten, where did that money go currently? The last five years. That, that went into the municipal budget. Correct. And it didn't go towards paying any of our debt for I&I &I or any of that? It, it probably did, yeah. But not directly. Well, in the last six years, it would have because we tracked, that right. stuff, we, we tracked that stuff pretty well, that anything that we took in that was sewer-related went to sewer. Okay, but prior to... Prior to that... Six it, years, we're I, not sure where. So, it, it, so probably... Picnic or whatever. But it's still to day. reimburse the other taxpayers of the town for the money they have been paying over the years. All right, so this is an astute decision by the five of you to do this. Is that correct, friend? I would say so. All right, good. <laughs> Wait a minute. Thanks. Praise Thanks. indeed, Chuck. <laughs> Did the earth just open or something? This <laughs> way. <laughs> it's, it's an extra full moon tonight. <laughs> Any other member of the public? You need to sit in the front. <laughs> I, I, I mentioned that the last time. You said the same thing then. Did mm. I? <laughs> yes, you did. Senior moment. Uh, just for point of clarification, 
the 54 rental units? Uh, no, we're not there yet. Not there. We're almost, we're almost. <laughs> Sit in the front, I promise. It's gonna be five minutes. You said open to the public. On this for, for, for this or, yeah. I apologize, okay. So uh, nothing else on this ordinance. I'm looking for a motion. Motion to approve 409-18 upon second reading as stated in the agenda. Second. Minuteman Maringolo? Yes. Minuteman Ray? Yes. Minuteman Schuler? Yes. Deputy Mayor Dorsey? Yes. Mayor Persergia? Yes. Okay, now, now it is old business, new business, yes? yes. Old, new? Uh, they, they, they forfeited their turn, old, new? I have nothing old, new. Administrative report? Yes. Um, I don't have anything to report on all of those things that I talked about at the last meeting. Good. Everything's status quo there, but I do have a few things. Um, we did discuss uh, the article in the Echo Sentinel about the recycling and how we were the lowest in the county yes. in 2015, so you asked me to check uh, with uh, Director Sweeney, and I did, and um, we increased our recycling between 2015 and 2016 when we put the two can limit, trash can limit on, by uh, a little more than 600 tons. Wow. So I assume which we is, moved up a little. Which is what percent? Do we know? That will come out next year. <laughs> well, what, what, how many tons did we do the year before? It's, it, it's a very complicated ratio. It's not just our municipal residential garbage versus our recycling. There's a lot of stuff that the state puts in there. But it's higher by a lot. It's higher, yeah. It's higher than 15. So I would say that is a another astute decision by this committee. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me popped up. <laughs> um, also, some good news. We were approved for um, our phase two of Morristown Road grant for the milling, paving, and um, related work. Um, uh, we received our extension from the Department of Transportation on our Oaks Road uh, awarding of our grant, okay. which I also brought up last time. Um, there, uh, regarding the Gillette train station lighting, um, someone from JCPNL is coming out next week to meet with Mr. Sweeney okay. to look at the uh, look at the light poles. Um, and if I could, just regarding that light pole, so, so so one of the things that I'm that I'm concerned about is that it turns into like a mini valley mall. Um, where the lights are on all night long. I don't know if the answer is, you know, the lights only go on till midnight or 11 p.m. or maybe they can do something where there's a trigger that when the train comes in, the lights go on. 10 minutes later, the lights go off, right? Because that is a largely residential neighborhood there. Mm. And, you know, I, I'd hate to start blanketing well, that place. How, in how late do the trains the run? Do you know how late the trains so, run? So, so the trains so, go. So think about the guys that live next door, and it's 2 a.m. and the train comes through, and all the lights <laughs> pop off. Well, but 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 we're also talking about. We're also, would, would you rather they stay on all night? I mean, no, I think at 11 o'clock cutoff. I, I mean, or something yeah. Like that. I mean, so, just so, on off. So so here's the thing. <laughs> after after about 7:30, the trains run once an hour. <clears throat> Right, so you're talking about leaving lights on for an hour for a benefit of six cars that are in there for five minutes, right? So if, if there's a way they can do something, I'd hate to do motion sensors because the deer, the, you know, but I mean. And that would be worse. Clearly there's a, there's, 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 there's a trigger somewhere that puts the gate down, right? If, if you can tap that trigger, although there may be some regulations about that that says, you know, oh, you've got the sensor to turn the, turn the gate down, turn the lights on, and then put it on a timer. 10 minutes later, turn it off. Okay, well, we'll check. It, it doesn't hurt to ask. Yep, okay, got that. I'm just trying to get JCPNL to put the full bill. <laughs> and I'm trying to mirror what Sterling and Millington have, existing light poles around all night long. And we're not, I know, but you a lot, but I know you're the Prince of Darkness. I know you want to. <laughs> I am the Prince of Darkness, and I, and, and I, and I, and I wear that uh, badge with honor. <laughs> I'll 
Yeah, I, I mean, they, they are two different neighborhoods, right? Sterling isn't, isn't surrounded by houses. You've got the church on the north side, right? And Millington, is there's no houses over there either. So they, they, it is kind of a different area. I mean, there are houses on three, basically, well, mm -hmm. two sides of that. Because yeah. the Chatham lots, lights stay on all night, I believe. But they, you're right, there's only on one side are there residences. <laughs> And, uh, and the lights may not be on on that side of the lot, now that I'm thinking. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I come home in the dark, 7, 8 o'clock. I, I don't find it a problem, but I, I understand that, you know, hey, it would be nice to have a little bit of light to see where you're going, but. It's also the back corner lot, which was Tom, Thomas, uh, Tom Groskoff was mentioning. But, but by 7, you know, by, you know, when I usually get home at 7, there's, you know, maybe 10 cars in there, you know, 15 cars. So we're, we're. I'm afraid we're we're over addressing what yeah. could be a very minor problem. Right. Yeah. Turn it off at 11 for sure, but maybe even 10. You can go yeah. lower bolt, bolt yeah. your LED so it's not as bright. Yeah. You still have to but I don't want to make it not effective, right? You don't want to put too dim where it doesn't really do any good. Then you've just wasted your I, time. I promised five minutes. Sorry. Now. <laughs> I have one more thing. Um, the uh, FEMA 90-day appeal process for the flood insurance rate maps um, has begun. I think people have seen things on social media. Um, I just wanted to explain a bit about that. I talked to our engineer about that. Um, regarding the appeal, the municipality has the right to appeal on behalf of all its residents. Um, however, um, he warns that if we did appeal, the cost would probably be in the low hundred thousands, and there's a good possibility that nothing would change. Um, so I don't know. I'm not going to speak for you, but uh, we're assuming that you wouldn't undertake this effort. So uh, there is an impact to residents. Um, the most significant significant impact um, is mm -hmm. that uh, property owners who get federally backed mortgages will now have to get flood insurance. Um, several meetings ago, we did talk about the community rating system program um, that we have in place here and that will help on, uh, uh, that will help with the discounts um, on your uh, flood insurance. Uh, but there is also a possibility uh, for homeowners, um, instead of appealing, uh, you could obtain a, a flood elevation certificate from a surveyor um, that establishes your uh, elevation and other parameters of your home, and that can be used in an application to FEMA for a letter of map amendment um, that can be used to show that the resident is above flood elevation and then eliminate the, fe eliminate the federal requirement for flood insurance, although some lenders may have still have the authority to require it. Um, so there is an alternative. Uh, if you are interested in the appeal process, um, there are a uh, variety of ways to contact FEMA. Um, and if it's not up already, uh, they, the contact information will be up on our website. That's all I have. Um, just, just to be clear, though, the, in, the individual property owner does have a right to appeal? Yes. Um, they, they don't I need believe. Us. Right. They do. I think the town could do it on behalf of everybody, but I believe that the individual um, uh, homeowners can appeal on their my, own. My understanding it's, was the map didn't change. It didn't change well, much. much. Um, it, uh, the proposed changes um, explain, expanded uh, and reduced floodplains in various areas. Like, for example, this building is now in the 500 year floodplain where it wasn't before. Um, so there were some changes. Uh, yeah, it's, I, it's minor unless you're the one that's not unless you're yeah. right. So, so I believe that homeowners have the individual right, but the expenses would be the same for them. Not that it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars for them, but they would be required um, to get a. Okay, he says that the appeal process to change the maps is very involved, requires a hydrologic and hydraulic analysis of the floodplain which means the collection of significant topographic survey information and a very involved computer model. Um, so I believe that that is the same, whether it's the municipality or an individual. So the uh, LOMA, as it's called, the Letter of Map Amendment, 
um, and an elevation certificate. I, I know people have done that, and it's a much more economical way to go. That it? I, that's it. All right, I'll, I'll time myself. It'll be a lot shorter. Just two announcements. If, uh, I'm sorry. If, if I could, I have one new item. Okay. Before you do your announcements, um, the finance committee um, met this afternoon um, with the um, first round of the budget, um, the operating budget. We didn't review, have a chance to review capex. We ran a little long. Um, we look to be in decent shape for this year. Um, we still have some things to verify, but so far it doesn't look like it's going to be a horrible year on the municipal side. Just remember, we're all counting on you. I know you are. And Bruce. I'm taking them down, well, with, you, I'm it, taking them down with me. <laughs> it, it was the uh, plural you. Or did you want me to say yous? Utes. You, two utes. Two utes. All right, so anybody else? Two announcements. The sixth annual <laughs> Morris County uh, Public Safety Youth Academy is, is Utes Academy, <laughs> July 23rd to July 27th. Applications are open March 1st to April 8th, and hopefully we can get it on the website, put it on the, uh, on the TV. I'm told this is a phenomenal program. I don't know if uh, Acting Chief Noggin knows about this. Uh, it's a uniquely designed uh, program provides cadets with intensive, specially designed training, hands-on experience, uh, areas of police, fire, EMS, emergency management. Class size is very limited. I'm told this, this always uh, is full. Uh, it's open to grades nine through 12. I, you know, I don't know if I'm doing it justice if somehow we can get it on uh, LHTV, on wherever we can put it on, on the Please, website, et cetera. Uh, and just one other announcement, I have to look on my uh, phone. Uh, our good friend and former uh, colleague up here, Guy Rashtow, along with his much, much smarter and better looking uh, better half, Kelly. They are, uh, the Long Hill Township Historical Society will meet tomorrow night, 7.30 at All Saints. For those who don't know where that is, that's 15 Basking Ridge Road in Millington. Uh, both Guy and Kelly have done presentations in the past. Uh, I've been at uh, one or two. They do a phenomenal job. This topic is the McGrath family legacy, three nuns, a sterling doctor, and town hall. I, I don't know if Guy's gonna turn it into a joke, it sounds like, but they didn't walk into a pub or anything. This talk begins in the 1840s, spans 100 years as it follows the story, unusual story of the McGrath family. Uh, their journey went from Ireland to a homestead farm in Gillette. Local history, uh, the unlikely story of a small town doctor become a professor, uh, New York Hospital, and ended up with a higher, higher calling. So please, anybody who can, I, I would encourage you to attend this tomorrow evening. Now that's it for my announcements. And at this point. So you got uh, the, the, the ones from Shane? Well, that, I had the two. One okay. was the Youth Academy, okay. and the other one was uh, Nancy Thank you. stole my thunder, and she right. did it first. Uh, so now, the moment we've all been waiting for. I can answer the question about the, uh, the train, the last train out. Okay, there you go. So we turn it over to you. And we won't even use that as part of your three I'll, minutes. I'll really be quick. Um, I live, my property borders on NJ Transit, so the last train out on weekdays is about 1.30 a.m. Yep. Mm. I hear it every night. Uh, the, just for point of clarification for my own uh, learning, the fair share hearing the four sites, the uh, thermoplastics that's out because of uh, water issues, then there's the Warren Avenue Sterling, the Gillette site on um, Valley Road and Latifa. We're committed to 54 rental or 72 sale units. Do that's, they, that's correct. Do they care if oh. we put all 54 rentals at one spot or? Uh, yes. Is that, up, is that up to us to decide where we put them? No, they, they care. They have to be per, at each site. So there, there has to be 15% or 20% 
depending on whether they're rental or for sale units. Can we exceed that? Can oh, we? sure. As long as we don't get below the 15 or 20 percent. So Correct. We, and if we just for theory, we could put 50 percent, let's say, at uh, Gillette or, or, or Sterling. Or and, and that would result, if, if we did, in fact, we've done that in past rounds, there were more units built and we got credits this round, which actually was very helpful and uh, in keeping the would, number down. Just so for my own clarification, the reason they don't want them all in one spot is because they want the affordable housing integrated into the community. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is why we shied away from, for example, it was mentioned yesterday that Warren mm -hmm. has uh, on property they previously owned, they're working with a developer to put 100% affordable housing in one location. Uh, they would not, I mean, I've spoken with them on uh, many occasions, they would never have done that if they had numbers like we have, 5472. Their number, I think, approaches 1,000. Yeah, I think it's yeah. 973 they're, or they're something in a, like that. They're in a bad way, yeah. and they're just trying to scramble any way they can. It's not a huge number that, that we're looking at, and um, having lived in Basking Ridge, I know the concentration there of the, the fair share of and, housing and, and, at, right. the, at the edge of the uh, uh, well, Spring Ridge. Well, they're talking about putting some into the quarry there with that development. I think that got dead. I think that's dead, dead now, yeah. yeah. dead now? Yeah. Yep. That's, that's the last I saw in the Burnersville News. And, and, and to be fair, I know I took a shot at uh, fair share and the, and, and the Mount Laurel and Coa rulings just because I don't think it's right to dictate to towns. Oh. But their, their intent I, in my mind, is in the right place. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. To, to Bruce's point, when you want to integrate, when you drive through the hills, for example, mixed in there are fair share housing, but nobody knows it. Mm -hmm. And that's the intent about integration. If you're going to do it, and we, I think we have the opportunity here in Long Hill, our number is smaller mm -hmm. than, say, Warren or, or Summit, you, you want to do it where it's fair people are integrated into the community. They are not, for lack of a better word, segregated. Yeah, yeah. I, I quite honestly didn't even know for the first number of years that I lived in Basking Ridge, which of the units there you go. Were, right. and which were not. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be just 20, 15%. We could go higher, which right. is, is good to hear. Uh, I, I, that's all I have. Uh, I mean, sorry you had to wait all that time, but thank you. I'm I mean, the, learning you know, as I go along. Thank you. The, 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 the fair share approach, like you said, it's like, it, it's like the heart is in the right place. But to me, the, the formula is just extremely messed up. It's not a formula about assuring how much affordable housing you have. It's a formula about forcing growth. Right. Right. And, that meant to be but, the but, worst example. But, yeah. I, I mean, but it, it, it's, it's, you know, like you said earlier, it, it's you negotiating at a table, you have a pencil and the other guy has a gun. You, you really got no choice in the matter. So the, I'm angry that we have to do 54 new things because we're pretty good on our existing affordable stock. But at the same time, I'm ecstatic that it's only 54 and it's not 300. Your point is valid and that's why Fair Shares uh, co-player throughout this process is the New Jersey Builders Association. Right. And they've spent a lot of money uh, oh, yeah. supporting Fair no Shares doubt. position no all the way through this. There are 600 miles. Say that again? There are 600 miles of waterways in Morris County. Did anyone know that? Yeah. You knew that? What do we have? Twelve miles uh, up Sack River frontage. Six hundred well, miles. Well, but we got we got a couple of little creeks too. Morris County. Right. Okay. And the reason that I know this is because this afternoon I encountered two mosquito control trucks desnagging the ditch behind American Legion. And what were you doing back there, Dennis? <laughs> Excuse me? What were you doing back there? I was driving past the uh, Warren Avenue and uh, Union Avenue intersection, and I looked, okay. and there were two trucks parked in the back of the Legion lot. And so I had to drive back and find out who they were. <laughs> I hope that silly question didn't eat into my three minutes. At any rate, <laughs> the, the, the crew 
from the Mosquito Commission tells me that they are desnagging all these little waterways and they were pulling all kinds of stuff out of that little ditch behind the Legion and apparently it is their intention over the next few days to do all 600 miles of those ditches in Morris County which I think is rather amazing. Just I asked them actually what I, what, why they were spraying mosquitoes this early in the season. They said they weren't spraying mosquitoes, they were desnagging. Just out of curiosity, Dennis, did you ask them how many miles are in Long Hill Township? No, I did not. Because I would imagine... We did talk a little bit about desnagging the Passaic River uh, some years ago, and they said yes, that was done, but it was a stop-start event, and they never seemed to be able to get ahead of it, almost like I and I. Hmm. Uh, at any rate, a little trivia for you. Thank you. They are destagging in Long Hill, and maybe they will finish doing all the rest of our ditches wherever they may be. Thank you. That is uh, good information. I'm surprised. You know, the only way we know this is because you were back there. Uh, no, they don't. We got an email. Oh, we did. I apologize. That's that. That's where I was going. I think I sent it out today or yesterday. We got it in. Okay. Charles, remember what's smelling? Just so you know. I had the Morris County Mosquito Commission down by the trough on Heritage Road about two weeks ago. I didn't follow them, didn't ask them what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> you're not, a, <laughs> you're, you're not as inquisitive as Dennis. <laughs> yes. And I wasn't driving, I was just looking. <laughs> First topic, I've got a lot of topics, but we'll try to get this done. Last night, and the planning board, Mr. Ray and Mr. Pashera, saw me present some pictures. I got more ink in my printer, and I'm going to present some pictures to Mr. Dorsey and Mr. Schuler. And unfortunately, Mr. Marengo, I ran out of ink. But I'll these, share. I'll share with him. Good. Uh, we, we, the, we, uh, these Don pictures, Richardson has them. We didn't. We didn't discard them. Yeah. These pictures are from a sewer break on the Tiffer property on May. 29, 2015. Here you go, Mr. Dorsey. I saw it last night. I see the pictures. But yeah, I but you heard the speech, right? Yes. And this is the representative. If you get an extra copy, that who came to the scene on June um, 18. Sean Hub. So I just point that out to you that. Uh, some consideration when we talking about building on this site. Apparently on tonight's agenda in private session, you talked about oratory. Last year- Do I need to recuse myself? I'm kidding aside, I, 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 but we're not voting on something. No, we're not unless, voting. We're just no. having a discussion. Okay. Uh, when the contract was released, 18 months ago or whatever, unfortunately at 5 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon for discussion at 3.30. If there's going to be any changes, I would ask that you share those changes or those discussions with the residents well before two or three hours so we could comment on that before you engage in a contract or a, rev or a revision thereof. There was discussion early in the evening about the land use ordinance being established a draft two years ago. I've issued three OPA requests on that draft. There has not been any supporting documents presented in response to that OPA request. So I kind of disregard the two year issue when nothing and no background studies or supporting documents have ever been prepared. Topic number three, redevelopment zone and affordable housing. We've had a problem with the redevelopment zone for affordable housing. We've been in negotiation, have a tentative settlement as of December 15, 2017. I would hope that you and the planning board open up discussions with the residents of where we should put affordable housing now that we've got a preliminary agreement. We welcome the opportunity for input to you 
in the planning board where we should have affordable housing. Today is March 1st, right? We all know that. I attended the last master plan committee meeting. It's, 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 it's tomorrow, Chuck. Yes. We're pushing March. <laughs> yes. oh, okay, we're still in advance. Well, An hour and 40 minutes. Hour. Hour. And, oh, okay. You're not, you're not going to speak for the hour and 40. Yeah, well, you get us tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I stand back. It's February 28th, <laughs> not leap year. I attended the last master plan committee. I attended last night's planning board meeting. When you anointed me to serve on the planning board some time ago, and the board elected me to a position of vice chairman, we made it a responsibility to have priorities established in January at the latest February. Neither the master plan committee or the planning board has had any discussion publicly on what the priorities are for the year. I would encourage you to direct the planning board to establish those and the mayoral committee of the master plan to get those in order. Affordable housing. There's been other communities that have came to a similar agreement to ours, and they have run into problems, and they recommended alternative sites. I'm assuming this township has the same opportunity. Is that not correct, Mr. Pigeon? As far as I know, those municipalities have not come to an agreement yet. They've had a preliminary agreement, and they've substituted properties in and out. I'm, I'm not aware of any of those. Right. But I don't have them in front of me, but I'll get them to you. In various emails to a number of you, I've recommended this document be provided to the planning board and to the master plan committee. This document is entitled New Jersey Municipal Master Plan Manual, prepared by the New Jersey planning officials. Believe me, it's well worth the investment. And given the fact that you anointed three new members to the master plan committee, I would strongly recommend that you issue these and buy these books for them to proceed and develop the master plan. It's very insightful and it's very good. Is it a, re is it a recent it uh, publication? Came out three years ago. Okay. Each chapter is generated by prior planning officials and it's very good. This will help document our master plan that started in 2013 as a re-examination. I know it's not March 1st, but I know it's 2018. <laughs> okay, is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. So I think we've got five years left and we need to do a better job on this. And this manual will help guide us as a guideline to the new members. Would you, I mean, you can get that information to De Deborah Kuntz. I think, I, I think that's a great suggestion. We have one of our new members in the audience. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for your time. And I didn't take till March the 1st, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Chuck, thank you. Any other members of the public? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion. Are we going back into private yes. session? Oh, I apologize. We're going back. No action taken. No action taken, right? Yep. Mo no. Motion to go into private session. No action to be taken. And Continue the prior discussions. And good night, everyone. Second. Second. Great meeting. I appreciate it. I know it was a lot of information.